Hello everyone and welcome back to Age of Nagash, which is a channel dedicated to Age of Sigma. And in this video it's going to be my list building for my Slaves to Darkness series. And I'm delighted again to welcome onto the channel Jamie, which is of course Corn's favourite bloodthirster. Or was it his most hatred one? What was it again, Jamie? I was definitely saying more favoured. Well, 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 we'll see about this. Particularly. But I, I, I kind of feel like through this series, you're trying to take my title with Corn and Slaves of Darkness. I, I, look, guys, what I want to say... Or is that you seeing the light and coming away from Slaanesh? It's me seeing, seeing the, light. <laughs> the light from my light in my room gleaming onto the rules for Corn in the battle tone. When I read the book and realise that I preferred those rules or the Sinesh rules. Um, but I started theming my army before the rules came out. But anyway, enough with that. The, the first few lists you'll see in this is probably going to be corn for me. But what we're going to do in this video is review lists for each sub allegiance. And that is going to be for so it's Darkness. So me and Jamie are going to come up with a list each for Ravengers. Uh, Kabulis, uh, what's the other one? Despoilers, host the ever chosen, and I will also come up with a list for Idolators and Knights of the Empty Throne. Jamie may also do that depending on timing, but if not, I will definitely come up with one anyway. Um, so, in this video, when we go through this list, what I want to say, and this is what I say in my other list building videos, is these lists are not going to be those tournament winning lists that you're going to look at to try and be as most competitive as you can be within this book. These lists are going to have a competitive edge, don't get me wrong, but it's more of a list that, in this video, with me and Jamie, um, what we would actually like to play on the tabletop and something that we think would be quite fun to use and wouldn't be, you know, a non-bad player experience for your opponent to play against. And I think an army that you can just overall have a good um, a good like enjoyment with but also it can be competitive as well it's not ignoring that factor so um, yeah so with that only thing I want to mention before we get started is a shout out to my patrons of course because it wasn't for them wouldn't be able to do this so that's going to be my Morgas, who is Sandback, Jonathan H and my Vampires which is Amir, Martin S, Rouse Routy 1, Max T, David A, my Necromancers, of course, which is Jack L, Radiation Riley, AW77, Dice Sagas, Wolf Nick, um, Filk, Michael W, and Quad. So, guys, thank you very much again for your continued support. Now, let us get on with the video for the list building of the Slaves to Darkness. So, the first one we're going to have a look at is going to be Ravengers. And this is going to be uh, the one that I came up with first. And we'll go through this, and then when we go through Jamie's one, obviously of the similar elements, we're not going to just repeat ourselves continuously, um, but we will mark out where things are different, as there are a few differences. And I think what is really going to show in this video is it can be the same army, it can be the same models in Slaves of Darkness, but by just making a few tweaks here and there, choosing a different god, or um, going for a different sub allegiance, you'll see a huge different in play style for the army which i think is something you would agree with as well jamie oh yeah definitely it's just like i say it's the same army we've got the same faction but just different marks of gods and a few different units in there and they're going to play completely different but exactly. still be a lot of fun will be a hell of a lot of fun um so for my list, we're going to go through what we've got and then we're going to talk about the tactics behind it. So, it is going to be um, like all the other lists in this, it's going to be up to 2,000 points and this list is actually 2,000 points on the dot. For our leaders, we're going to have a Bellacor um, and his spell is going to be Mask of Darkness and he is obviously the mark undivided. But everything else in this list is going to have the core mark apart from one other unit we'll get to. So we've got a Chaos Lord on Manticore with a Blade and Lance and his artifact is Mark of the High Favoured and he's marked Corn like I've said and because this is Ravengers he can have a command trait along with four other non-Demon Prince heroes in the army. So he is going to have Master of Deception which makes the enemy minus one to hit and the High Favoured means that he's got a Chaos War of 18 inches. Um, we have the Chaos Lord on Karkadrak with the artifact Incandescent Rage Blade, which is actually from the mortal realms of um, Ashri of Fire. 
And what that means is that when he rolls a six to hit, it's going to explode and give him two wound rolls for one of his um, weapons, which is going to be his big, lovely two damage axe. Um, and then his command trait is going to be internal vendetta. So what that means is he can re-roll wound rolls of one, but... Um, oh, let me just actually quickly check, just make sure it's right. So I have a wound rolls of one or... You can re-roll. It's all for the wound rolls, isn't it? And then yeah, if the addition, the addition bit, well, it's only tripping up on, is if it's against order, you can re-roll your hit rolls as well, which is fantastic, right? Um, so that turns him into a pretty killy guy. And then we're going to actually have an other Chaos Lord and Carcadrac, because correct me wrong, Jamie, if I am, but how cool is the Chaos Lord and Carcadrac? Just generally. <laughs> Oh yeah, it, it's the whole reason we got the the whole new box, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's. The, I mean, the knights and the warriors are lovely, but that car trap, whoa, so nice. Um, anyway, so he again is going to have the mark of uh, chaos for corn. Um, his Ma ravenger's command trait is going to be the flames of spite, which means if he gets a wound roll of a six, um, it is going to do one mortal wound to the enemy. And then we've got the chaos on demonic mount, which um, again is corn. And he is going to have the command trait bolstered by hate, which means he then actually has goes from having eight wounds to ten wounds, which means he's pretty hefty at that point. And then we're going to have a Chaos Lord um, who's got the Reaper Blade and Demon Bound uh, Steel and obviously Corn. And Ramon's command trait is favoured of the Pantheon. So that means if he triggers the Arthur God ability, so if he kills a enemy hero or monster at the end of the combat phase... Um, you can see if he gets a boon from the Eye of the Gods table, and it means he can adjust that result by two. So, you know, if this guy happens to kill something, he's got the most to gain from turning into a demon prince, is how I'm looking at it, basically, of just being a Chaos Lord. So, for our battle line, we are going to have two units of five Chaos Knights, each with lances, and then we're going to have a unit of five Chaos Warriors, and they're going to have sword and shields for our and they're all going to be corn as well. Then our other unit that can't be corn is um, going to be a mind stealer uh, Shirax to try and make the enemy uh, fight last. And then for our behemoths, we've got that Chaos Lord on Manticore. And then we do actually have um, a battalion in this list, and it's going to be the Blood Mart Warband, which is the corn warband for Slaves of Darkness. That means that when a enemy, um, so when a hero from my battalion kills a enemy model in the combat phase, I can pick an other unit from my battalion wholly within 12 inches of my corn hero from this battalion, and uh, or mortal slaves to darkness corn hero, and pick that unit within 12 inches, and then they add one to their attacks uh, for that combat phase, which is pretty damn good. And that also leads into the reason of why I've gone so heavy on the heroes. Do you, can you kind of understand how that makes sense, Jamie? Yeah, I mean, if you're trying to get your heroes to kill something, you want the more beefier heroes, which, from what you're saying from your list there, Chaos of Lord on Manticore, two Chaos Lord on Cartodrac are pretty beasty. Yep. Are they, they can, like... So, uh, just to correct myself as words, that I said... Um, for that phase they get add one attacks actually into your next hero phase so that's why i really like it as you can see here my combat power is in my heroes sure chaos knights when they charge they can do some damage um but really how this kind of works is me probably killing things with my heroes and then buffing my other heroes as well um because they're just so combat focused the chaos lord and manticore can be pretty mean when it goes into the enemy, especially with the blade and lance, it can do a lot of damage. And the Chaos Lords on Karkadrak, they're also very survivable with that 3-up save and then also that 5-up mortal wound save. And um, they work very well with the Chaos Knights, right? So they can buff them up. You've also got that Chaos on Demonic Mount. Well, don't get me wrong, he's got 4 attacks as well that are going to do 2 damage with his big uh, Warhammer. And like I said, the Chaos Lord and Karkadrak... Um, with the incandescent rage blade, that acts just for example. One of his attacks, um, five attacks, uh, hitting on threes, rerolling ones, wounding on twos. Because remember, we're corn here, and if he's in range of the general, he's getting plus one to wound. 
No rend, unfortunately, but two damage. And bear in mind he's re-rolling his wound rolls as well. And it's also going to help out his sword. And I've had this Chaos Lord and Carcadrac. We would have all talked about this when we reviewed these units as well. So I don't want to repeat myself too much. If you want more detail about each unit, go check out those videos. But this guy got charged by 10 Drakespawn Knights. And the Drakespawn Knights did free damage to him. And he actually ended up wiping out i think it was eight of them in just retaliation because when you're when you go from your attacks when you look at it it's just freeze and freeze and go oh, that's all right but it's now freeze rerunning ones uh twos rerunning ones and your sixes to hit exploding for your axe is huge right yeah you're gonna want them aren't you yeah and then what that means is he's obviously more likely going to kill an enemy model with that, and now he's going to pick the other Carcadrac to get plus one to its uh, attacks. Which, the other thing to mention with getting plus one to your attacks, to make it even better, is that um, it's going to affect your mounts, right? So now your Chaos Carcadrac, who has, I think he's got four attack profiles, um, have all now got an extra attack. As just an example of um, how this battalion works. Yeah, and, and going on to, um, so like going into your list now, one thing what people might be thinking, well, you don't really have many units, but then the key thing for the Ravagers yes. is in their command ability. And we'll get into my list in a bit, but I was trying to get in a battalion as well. I couldn't, because you want a command point in this army. Yeah, this this is so command point hungry. So that's a great point you mentioned, Jamie. I'll, I'll talk about that now. So in this list, as you can see, it's very model light. Like, um, there's very few units. I've literally gone all in on the heroes, which are quite expensive heroes. No, like, 500-point monsters, but a lot of 200-something points. Um, and that is so that the heroes can do as much killing as possible to try and make the most of the... Blood March Warband. I've got things like a Chaos Lord on foot to make the enemy be to make me be able to pine attack twice. Um, I've also made him the general to start with because, like Jamie said, um, what I can do with Ravagers basically is I can bring on um, how I look at it. You can well, you can bring on either ten Chaos Marauders um, a turn basically in each of your turns. Or you can bring on five Chaos Marauder Horsemen or one Cultist uh, unit of up to ten models to the battlefield. But only each hero can only do that one time, right? And it has to be like a like a non-like demonic um, hero. So that means I can do that five times in my army. So what I'm going to do is bring on ten Marauders in each of my turns. And I'm going to start off by putting it on the Chaos Lord of Foot because... I don't want him to be the general for long because he's got the least um, capability of giving my chaos aura of the um, plus one to wound and re hit rolls of ones uh, where I need it. So we'll get him out of the way, get him to do it straight away. And that explains my list because now my list that's very um, hard at sort of capturing objectives with how low on model count I am um, and units. But now we're bringing on 50 marauders in the game. 10 units at a time, or 10 models at a time, uh, it's pretty big because those Marauders, when they come on, if you can make them be 9 inches away from an enemy that's on an objective when they come on from the board edge, they will make that charge. And they, if it's like a weak unit the enemy's put on that objective, they will take that objective. So the enemy's always going to be constantly worrying about their backboard um, continuously. And then it makes up for the lack of models I have in my starting army. Um, and then the other things to say with my list, like the, the five Chaos Warriors are there to hold an objective, right? That's their job. Um, they're just there. They're there to screen as well if you want to. The Chaos Knights are there as like backup for your uh, very combat offensive heroes um, because the Chaos Knights can do a lot of damage as their own and they're fast. And the other thing to say about my... Um, damage dealing heroes is that they're all fast right so they can get so to make up with my lack of models there as well they've got good movability 
Um, the mind of this Sphinx is to make the enemy fight last, which in all honesty, every time I've used it, it's been brilliant. I've always got it off because the enemy only has one in six chance of stopping you with how that works. Again, if you want more details of that, go check out those videos. Um, but essentially what you do, pick an enemy unit within 12 inches of you in your hero phase from the mind stealer, and you pick a number on a dice, your opponent picks a number on a dice in secret, you show them to each other, if they don't match, that enemy unit you picked fights last. Which then means you can dogpile it if it's a big scary unit of all your heroes. Um, and then we've got, any really other thing to say, we've got Bellacore in there, uh, Mask and Darkness means that I can teleport a unit, that's his spell, that's um, my teleport away in the army as I can go for the spell uh, Bind and Damnation I believe it's called to make the enemy fight last but the teleport is something that can win your games where the making you fight last spell is something that can be game changing which sounds quite similar but winning the game it can be huge with the Mask of Darkness and Bellicor's there to uh, bugger up the enemy as normal by uh, picking one of their units and then making them for one turn, potentially two turns, only doing stuff on fives up. So if the enemy's got one big scary unit, put it on that um, if you want, and then that means that they can't really do anything. And if the enemy's got two scary units, put the mind steeder on the other thing, charge everything into it, you're doing all that damage while the other unit can't really do anything. Um, and then the other thing to say about this list is that it's free drops because... Bloodmarked uh, Warband has everything apart from the Mind Stealer and Bellacor because they can't have the corn keyword. You could take out things like, uh, well, obviously, Bellacor and the Mind Stealer, and then you can have a one drop list in your Slaves of Darkness here. I've paid for an extra command point, so when you said, Jamie, that command point's very important, I'm starting the game with two, and then in my first turn, I have three. Yeah, and, and that's definitely, I'd say, a, a way you want to kind of maybe try and build your list around for ravages. Yeah. Cause Cause if you, it, it depends, obviously, if you are planning on wanting to, obviously you don't have to until you need to, but depending on your list, like for yours in particular, like say you've got kind of low board coverage. Oh, really? Like, you, yeah. you got, you know, your units aren't that big and you got a lot of heroes. But if you, you know, you're going to want to plan to bring on, like say, 10 Marauders, hopefully every turn. And you're going to need those command points to do that, as well as have command points for anything else that you might need, want to do, fighting twice with the Chaos Lord, exactly. um, um, like doing the, your Carpet Dragon ability on the Chaos Knights. Knights for the charge, you know. That's, I mean, that, that's something we've talked about as well. It depends obviously on your list, but Slaves of Darkness is generally a really command point hungry army. So, you can't, if you're not really paying for any extra command points, haven't got a battalion, you can't really guarantee you're bringing on 10 Marauders every turn. Or a unit of Colors or Marauder Horsemen, right? right? Now that I'm starting with two extra, if everything goes okay, I can kind of guarantee, like, for the first few turns anyway. Yeah, uh, and there's only like, um, like only the Lumineth, I think, are the only ones who can maybe screw things up with their um, ability to make you have to spend two command points when you want to spend one. I think they are the only army that can affect you in that way. I I agree. I think I think that's that's a good point there as well. Um, and something else I just want to note here is because like when we talk about list building for say Starkness, a lot of people go like depending on your list here, and I know your one's gonna. Um, we'll talk quite more about it in your one as well, James, because I know you've got some of those units. But I just want to address the fact that when people go like, doesn't matter what you're taking Slaves of Darkness, you have to take a Chaos Sorcerer Lord, and you have to take a War Shrine. They're just things you have to do. Right, the Chaos Sorcerer Lord, I'll just say, um, is great, fantastic, especially as, uh, you've got one in your list coming up, have you, Jamie? I believe. Yeah. Yeah, so like, it's great, definitely in your list. In my list... How I'm going to be running it, because the great other thing to say about Ravengers is that you can change who's your general every um, every hero phase. So I haven't mentioned that. That's why the Chaos Lord is the general first, because then I can switch it onto someone else later. And in my uh, corn army, yeah, I haven't got my wizard, which means to give me reroll uh, wound and to hit rolls, but my army is all practically hitting on freeze 
re-rolling ones anyway. And then getting plus one to wound. Which, again, re-rolling the failed wound rolls and hit rolls is still good. But it's no longer, I feel, essential. My knights, yes, are still hitting on fours. But I can give them plus one from the um, Chaos Lord on uh, Karkadrak or Chaos Lord on a Mount. And then I can make them re-roll ones to hit, right? So now I'm only failing on twos. So... It's not as vital, and I just wanted to address that, because in 8 out of 10 Slaves of Darkness lists, it probably is vital. But sometimes it's not always vital. It just takes a little bit more of, um, I don't know, thinking outside the box or something. Like, don't just think it always needs to take it. And because I haven't taken it, it means my drops is uh, down by 1, and it means that I could put in another corn hero for the Bloodmarked Warband. Um, but yeah, so that's quite good. Um, also, the Mines the Sphinx. Um, I also use it to screen my five Chaos Knights as they move up the board. If this Sphinx gets charged and killed, fine, my five Chaos Knights are still good to then make a counter charge. Um, and that's about it. Is there any other questions you kind of have for that list, Jamie? No, I think you've like, covered it pretty well. And like I was saying, with the Ravages' ability to summon on the board, it kind of makes up for. The lack of, I'd say, like board coverage that your your army represents. Oh yeah, and that's no. that's playing into the Ravagers' strength, isn't it? Strength and ability, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, because that's why I like Slaves of Darkness. Because you know when I said like, if you take a different sub allegiance, you can make it play hugely differently. And that's because like, I wouldn't run this list in any of the other sub allegiances because I am really relying on bringing on reinforcements. Right, I. You would have to be pretty lucky to run this list without being able to bring in reinforcements and still be able to control the board, right? Like, you you really need to take it in Ravagers. And the other reason why I've gone for this in Ravagers is the first time I came up with this. I'll be honest, I wasn't making it to be competitive. I was making it um, just for fun. Because I was like, I want to roll in the Eye of the Gods. If you watched it when me and Jane reviewed that, you'll know that that's one of our favourite abilities in Slaves of Darkness. It's not the most powerful, but the idea of turning like normal mortals into demon princes, awesome, right? Throughout the game. So, um, I thought, I would just want to make a list with as many Chaos Lords as possible to try and benefit that going off. And then I took it, and it turns out to be um, to be pretty strong, because when you take something like this in Ravengers, yes, you bring on those extra models, which I said is needed, but you're also giving all of your Chaos Lords command traits. To make them more kiddie in combat. When they, they can be pretty damn, as we've said, like with examples, good in combat. Um, yeah, that's, an, that's another good strong point of the Ravages is all your heroes, apart from Demon Princes, so that's like why I've left them out of mine. Yeah. Get, get a command rank. And that just, even though it's up, you know, some of the command traits. I'll be hit and miss, mm -hmm. but the, the, you the, you got a lot there that can really help. Yeah, exactly. Like when I first read them, I'm not gonna lie, I was miffed at them, and I was like, oh yeah, they are hit and miss. I don't really like them. But internal vendetta, like I've already said, for uh, one of the chaos lords and Karkajak, right? When you look at him, it's just like, ah, oh, so that'll make him hit on. He's still hitting on freeze, wounding on freeze, but re-rolling the wound rolls. Presumably not playing against order, right? Be rolling the wound rolls. Um, it's all right, you know. It's not great, shall we say? Um, put him corn. Make sure he's either the general or in range of the general. Right, cool. So he's hitting on threes, re-rolling ones, only failing on those twos. And then if you get through to wound rolls, you're wounded on twos, re-rolling all fails. So you're probably going to get it all through. And then it just turns him into a beast, right? A model that I didn't really think was good in the game turns into a, a pretty good blender um just to say like um why i went through giving these command traits to the certain heroes because i think that's if you're building a list like this you're going to wonder oh what command trait do i give to each hero because you're not used to picking five right um so i just quickly go through that as well so the chaos lord manticore he has got the master of deception because that subtracts one for hit rolls that attacks him with uh, melee weapons right the reason i gave it to him he's got the biggest base so he's probably got the most stuff piling and attacking him right so you're probably making the most of that minus one to hit for the enemy. That's why I did that. Um, and then the Kirsten on the Cockstrap, like I said, it's got the um, 
uh, Eternal Vendetta. The next one, Flames or Spite, for the Chaos Lord Karkadrak is because he, at that point, has the most... Uh, yeah, because it's for all of the General's melee weapons, apart from the mount, obviously. He's got two different weapons, right? So that's eight attacks in total. So you're making the most of trying to get those sixes to wound to do an extra mortal wound to the enemy. Whereas there's more point giving it to the Karkadrak than the Chaos Lawn Demonic Mount, who only has four attacks. So you're getting double the amount of chances of getting those sixes to mortal wounds. You, you're following that, aren't you, Jamie? Yeah, because it's funny that I've done uh, my Lord and Karkadrak has the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's good, right? Um, and then the Chaos Lawn Demonic Mount, he has... Um, so he's got the Bolts by Hate, which is just a, a general good one, right? Adding two to his wound characteristic, this guy is, I think he, I'm just going to double check, because I said he was eight wounds earlier, but I think he is, so I think he, that should put him on ten. Um, well, sorry, um, so I'm pretty sure he has, because I've got a little voice in the back of my head now telling me that it's actually not ten, and it's, no, yeah, so I was right, so he has got eight, so then it goes up to ten. I was thinking that maybe once upon a time he was seven. But I know the Chaos Lord on foot is seven, actually, thinking about it. And that's just great, right? Um, and then, like I say, he's got the trait for the Chaos Lord on foot, uh, the favoured of the uh, Pantheon. So if he does kill something, who knows? He could turn into a Demon Prince or turn into being able to make you summon, uh, in this case, ten Blood Letters. So, pretty good. Um, cool. So I'm happy with that. So, guys, what I'd say is also when we go through these lists, if you've got any questions or anything like that, please put them in the comments down below and I'll be happy to answer anything we didn't cover so going on to the next list it's going to be your one jamie so take us through your ravengers list um my ravenger list i've decided to go full-on nurgle cool. uh, everyone in nurgle and i think when you include wizards i think that's why i've stayed you know, i knew you you're probably going to call but i went away because the fact of if you collect got sorcerers and that, they're going to give no buff. If the rest of your stuff is because they can't be corn. Corn don't like wizards. No. So we are starting off with the heroes. We have got the Chaos Sorcerer Lord, Nurgle. Got to have the Mask of Darkness. Yeah. Got to have a teleport spell. It's such a vital, isn't it? Right. Game. Vital one, game isn't it? And I gave him the command trait. Questioned. Unquestioned resolve. Okay. Which, at the beginning, so once per turn, he gets to use at the double, forward to victory, or inspiring presence, commandably, without using a command point. But it's only for cultists. I've got no cultists in my original list, but Ravagers, I can summon them on. So, I kind of think of that combination. So, summon on Iron Golems. They are very tanky, and now they're not running away because I've got a free command point to inspire and presence them yep. to protect any objective I want to put them on. Yes, and I've got an exalted hero in here just yep. for the fact of he's cheap and he's given me the aura, yeah, and also he's given me a one turn summon as well. And he has the command trait favorite of the Pantheon. You never know, I might be feeling lucky. You might kill a little wizard, and you get to add two to your uh, eye of the gods. So it's hopefully, not like curse Lord of foot. You know, you get a chance it. <laughs> you know, but he is mainly there for just to give me an aura. Yeah, and he, you know, he brings on a cult which you know, a temporal or a moral horseman. Like he makes up his points, right? Yeah. So we got a council lord, sorcerer lord on Manticore. And he has the Binding Damnation spell, uh, Fight Last spell. And he has the Command Train bolstered by hate, so he has an extra two wounds. And I've got the Castle on Karkadrak, much like yours, has the Flame of Spite. Six is to wound, does a mortal wound. And I've done that for the same reason you did, in the fact that he has the most attacks with his sword and axe. And mortal wounds is a nice way for him to. Make sure he does extra damage. Yep. But it's in it's in addition, isn't it? 
Oh, it's an addition, yeah. So. So. Always better when it's in addition. And then I have a Chaos Lord on foot with the Master of Deception. So he's minus one to hit in melee. Which he is going to be running up with a unit. So and he the, will be in melee. And the enemy may, may try and want to get rid of him just to get rid of that pile attack twice. To get, yeah, to get rid of the pile attack twice. Then the battle line have five Chaos Knights with ensorcelled weapons, 40 Chaos Marauders. Five Chaos Knights with Lances, and then ten Chaos Chosen, and then one Behemoth of Chaos of War Shrine. I did pay for the extra command point, and I actually put in a, um, I had quite a few points left over, but it wasn't enough to bring in my Iron Golems. I had six points left, according to what I was using it on. You've so got... I'll put in the Prismatic Palisade. Yeah, so I, literally, I don't know why, but when I was creating these, uh, like the layout and stuff, as you can see on the screen, for these lists, um, I went for the effort of creating like its own box for endless spells, and then I put none in there for some reason. <laughs> but <laughs> you've got you've got the Palisade, right? I'm not going to try and spell that, because I'll probably get it wrong. But we've got the Palisade in this list, we know that. Okay, that's fine. But still, it's still like... Um... I'm still relying. I've got five heroes. Yeah. There's five turns. Definitely wanted to buy that extra command point at the beginning. Mm. I've done five heroes. You always feel like you need to do six because you can have each one of them have command trait. I thought, right, there's five turns, <clears throat> five heroes. I don't have to do it every turn. Well, yeah. And I was just going to say. That only five of them could have command traits anyway. The five different. If your general is not a demon prince, you can pick one command trait for up to five different for any year. So, like, your Chaos Lord and the Manticore hasn't got a command trait, as an example. So that's the one you haven't gone for. Oh, did I not give him one? No. Is there, is there anything you want no, to do? Yeah, the one on command track, he's got the famous fight. Famous fight, I'm on a fight. That's command track. I did give him the artifact as well. Well, well Chaos Which was the same one as yours, the mark of the high favoured. Chaos Sorcerer Lord. Chaos Sorcerer Lord had a uh, bolstered by hate, plus two wounds. Yeah, the Chaos Sorcerer on Manticore. That hasn't got any, has it? Oh, I didn't. I didn't put it in there. But yeah, he does have um, because there's five of them. So he has um, bolstered by hate. Okay, he has plus fine. two wounds. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Ignore me because you only have five heroes here. That's fine. Cool. Bolstered by it. So an extra two wounds. So he's got, oh, fourteen wounds, isn't he? I think, it's, I think it's sixteen now, isn't it? I thought he started off with fourteen. Uh, no, yeah, it starts with twelve. Yeah, so, so yeah, up to fourteen now. survivable though. Which I tell you what, monsters with twelve yeah. wounds sound survivable, but they're not. And and that's why I like the the Chaos War Shrine's in there. Because Chaos War Shrine, you pick a Nurgle unit and on on a three plus, they rewrite all foul wounds. But if they're Nurgle, like if you use the Nurgle Pacific Prayer, you get plus one to your save. And also if my opponent has some shooting, whoever my general is is giving out a um Minus one to hit for shooting it as well. Yeah, it's great. Which is a, a great added bonus. It was in like it's not as often coming up as the corn one. No, but it's but still when it when it's, it's useful, still good. It's really useful. I mean, like I had a game against Seraphon lately, right? And in that army was three Bastilodons and one Stegodon with a big crossbow on it, right? He had command points to make them all fire twice in his shooting phase. So that's already shooting me, what, like eight times of those dinosaurs. And yeah, and just he, have minus one to hit, it's going to be... He also got a double turn, so he shot me 16 times. <laughs> so like, I, I like, you are, yeah, like you say, it's not as all the time as the uh, reroll ones to hit, or the plus one to wound. Um, but... Also, it's not because 
that's the reroll ones to hit, uh, what you get instead. But when you're going against something like that, it, it will be a game, <laughs> game saver I want to go for. <laughs> like, but also, I'm sure what you're about yeah. to say is that your heroes, of course, like will be minus two when they look at Sir uh, if they're not a monster, etc. Yeah, and it's like um, the, the spells we've both chose, like the teleport one is, like you said in yours, it's more of a game-winning one. Um, giving you an advantage in combat for fighting last. Obviously, oh, yeah. I've got another wizard, so yeah. I, I've got the fighting last one as well. And that's there to help whatever <coughs> units I've charged him with. Because I've got Chaos Knights, they can both do some damage. I've got one unit with lances for the charge. I've got one unit with ensorcelled weapons. Kind of being a bit more of a boggy down kind of unit. I can give them the plus one save, I can give them the reroll all foul saves on the Cow Sorcerer Lord, so they can be a free up re rolling, as well as being re rolling all failed wounds. And the you know, sorcerer weapons are freeze and freeze with what, free they got an extra attack over the Lancet. Uh, yes, what the um, ensorcelled weapons? Yeah. Yeah. So more more dice to um, get those sixes on the wound. Yeah. Uh, look, I will always persistently say lances every time for Chaos Knight, but I do get it that with Nurgle, it's giving you more chances to get those um, sixes to wound. Also, if you're bogged down in combat, they can fight their way out of it, unlike the. Chaos Knights with Lancers that are stuck in a paper bag. And also, you know, if you even go Sinesh, right? This is more more attacks. Um, so I, I do get it that Enscrolled Weapons can be good as well. Yeah, my little, my little exalt, exalted hero kind of idea was he's a cheap hero to give an aura. And I can just have him absolutely hugging the Chaos Chosen. Yes. So I've got a nice unit of 10 in my list. And yeah. that's 10 attacks each, uh, 3 attacks each. 31 attacks with the commander at freeze and freeze minus one one damage obviously any sixes to wound with the exalted hero behind them it's going to be an extra damage and then if they kill we you know bit any they kill any models my other mortal states of darkness units hold within 12 of them Get the reroll all death out of wounds. Yeah, that's Which for point. Nurgle it's huge. is what you want. Yeah. I mean, we'd... is it all other units out of interest? Or is it all uh, more space of darkness? darkness. So, yeah. if you. I'm just trying to think. Like, you could put. I'm sure you're going to talk through what you're going to do the Marauders. But if you had the Exalted Hero in hugging the Marauders, right? But. Then uh, you... That's for the Chaos Lord. <laughs> that's a, yeah, so they, all, all I was going to say, I know it might be better, all I was going to say is the Chaos Lord on foot, right? So with the Chaos Chosen, so then if they pile an attack again, then themselves are rerun on those wind rolls as well. So yeah. The second time they do. So that means they could do, and if you're thinking, well, you know, 10, how they were going to get into combat one at range, they, trust me, they do. Uh, take them in 10s. That would be uh, 70. No, that would be 62 attacks um, on the second lot of it, so the second 31, uh, re-rolling wind rolls. Yeah, but uh, Marauders can be pretty devastating as it is. So. Yeah, Marauders can be pretty devastating. And I wanted to have a big block for some extra coverage as well. Yep. Yeah. And having... Um, Right, you got the Chaos Lord in there to make, make him pilot and attack twice. <clears throat> Not that they probably need to. <laughs> I, I kind of don't think they probably would need to. No, I. So. The, but I'm, I'm sure it's quite a small. small range as well. What's that, the pilot attack twice? But even then. Holy than 12. It's saying that I, I could teleport the uh, Marauders forward and just bog down my enemy. 
in in that area while I teleport in Chaos Marauders off the board edge or Marauder Horsemen and put my knights on the objectives while my opponent just tries to deal with a whole bunch of angry marauders. Yeah, so like a list that I have coming up, I won't get into now, but it, it, it does work like that. 40 marauders is the first wave. Uh, they bog down the enemy, so then everything else in my army that's a bit slower um, will be able to charge the enemy turn two. It, it works well. The only, the only reason I said the Chaos Lord being with the Chosen instead is because being someone like myself when I tried out 40 marauders, they're, obviously they're great, fantastic. They will very easily be outside of Holy within 12 inches. Yeah, so, that would be the thing, especially if you um, teleport them. Yeah, so that, that's just why, like, the Ke honestly, I think Chaos Chosen with that as well, because they obviously got that benefit of the rerun of Wound Rolls for your Nurgle. It's a really good combo you've got there. Yeah, and plus with like, the Marauders, just before you send them off, you can make them, you can buff them up the pretty shrine. well. Yeah, you got the Shrine to buff them up, you can make them reroll Wound Rolls and give them plus one to save. <laughs> or should you give them, I believe, a four up save? You put the ocular vision on, four yeah. up, free rolling, and then teleport them off. And they're going to do some damage. And, and not die in droves as much as what you might think with a four up, free rolling. No, because the biggest thing you want to do there is. Even with your Karkadrak, right? If you want to use it as like a first wave thing, um, have your Karkadrak uh, run up the board. Um, yeah, he won't be able to charge, but just make sure he is within six inches of... Okay, well, actually, in this army, it's, it, it is easier because whoever is the general, make sure they are within 12 inches of the Marauders for when it comes to the Battleshock phase, because then you're just inspiring presence them, and then the enemies bog down there another turn. So either if it's your general, who you can obviously choose with Ravengers, or if it's not your general, make sure it's within six inches instead of the twelve. I think that's one of my favourite things about Ravengers is you can freely change the general, yes. and you can pick and choose where you want, <clears throat> mainly the second part of your aura to be. So like for corn, it's plus one to wound. Yep. For me, it's not. Uh, I, I say it's, not, it's more enemy specific with the minus one to hit from shooting. That's the second part, right? The minus one to hit. Yeah. Cool. But it does mean if you're up against, and I say say carried on overlords, you, you're going to know what they're kind of eyeing up. You can just make your general over there and he gives off a minus one to hit bubble. Definitely. And um what did you <coughs> what artifact did you mask with the high favoured? So when you put it on your chaos on a car track, obviously it's um it's the same for you and it's the same for me. When the turn when things are gonna go down for me when I wanna be as combat effectively, I will make my Chaos on Manticore the uh, mark and high favoured, so I've got that whole holy within 18 inches bubble for the uh, aura of chaos. Whereas yourself, if you think war might take a lot of hit from uh, shooting this turn, you make your chaos lord on Karkadrak the uh, general, right? And then you've got the big bubble. Of yeah, I, I kind of feel like that is the go to artifact for sure. Yeah, um, I'll be honest, that's like one of the first that caught my eye. I was like, oh, that's cool, because basically when I look over stuff, um, in artifacts, I tend to glance at it trying to see like the keywords. So like if I see keyword Ravengers that this has got, I'm like, this is buffing the army, right? Because Slaves of Darkness is an army buffer. The whole army buffs the army, and that's how it works. And that is why it is so important um, in this army that you can change who your general is in Ravengers. Because in most other armies, you'd go, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. It's useful, but it doesn't make too much of a difference. Um, whereas in this... It makes a huge difference because then you're like we've just talked about uh, choosing where you're going to get your extra aura buff from. So it, it makes a big difference. And yeah, the uh, the other artifacts after mark after mark of the high favor are um, are mediocre. Yeah, if there was one in there for command points, I probably would have taken that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, it's like but, I, for my second that, artifacts. That one, eight inch bubble. 
like for you, it, it'd be a lot more beneficial the for the reroll ones. Because obviously that Ravager unit is Ravager units are fed by the bearers or by the they are with a hole of an eighteen and obviously your general will also give an eighteen inch. No. Your no your normal inch, hero will give the eighteen inch for the reroll ones. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why it's on the manticore because it's a bigger base, so it's just Yeah, because... I, I was I was thinking that up. But I kinda of felt like the Chaos Lord and Copper is gonna be in the thick of things, so Yes. Um because like the social law, we've talked about it, uh, we've reviewed it again. As always, check out that video. Um, but the, the social law, where you could go, he could get in the fight. The chaos lord or manticore is like, I'm getting in the fight right now. I don't care if I roll badly. I'm fighting. Like so, you know it. Yeah, it, that's it, kind of I like, get my sorcerer lord or manticore the plus two wounds, just so he can take any kind of like incoming fire and take a bit more damage. Because I want him there to be ready to wipe out hordes, so he's going to have to be close to the hordes. Yeah, do you want to do you want to tell us his a uh, horde clearing spell just briefly? Because I know that's like one of the main reasons he's in the list. Yeah, so he's in in built spell the winds of chaos and it's cast of value seven. Pick an enemy unit within eighteen inches of him. A roll number of dice equal to the number of models in that unit. For each five plus, if they suffer one mortal wound. And for each six plus, it's D3 mortal wounds. So, a good old block of, say, 40 marauders. <laughs> 40 dice you're rolling. You're to at least kill half the unit, I imagine. Yeah, e easy. Like, um, even this grots out there was 60 in a unit, right? Um, yeah, and what's the, what's the biggest one? The ones that ogres can take. Gretchen. Is it Gretchen? Gretchen, yeah. Are they, are they more than 60? I think you can have 18. Oh, wow. Well, like, whatever you can have, like, it's a lot of dice, right? And that is... This is why this Chaos Sorcerer Lord and Manticore can be uh, considered an auto-include, that he's more expensive to just go, yeah, take him. But that's it's just because of his spell, right? Like having that capability to deal with hordes, because a lot of the times when I build armies, I build rare elite armies, so they're good against other elite armies, shall we say, with high armor saves because I've got rend, I've got high damage, blah blah blah. But when I come across a horde army, I'm just like, oh, I just haven't got enough attacks for this. So it can be useful to have that Chaos Sorceress uh, Lord Manticore for that. One of the best horde clearing spells in the game, 100%. And the other thing with it, it's within 18 inches, which is different to a lot of the um, spells for uh, the State of Darkness, which are within. So, uh, within 12 inches even. So, yeah. Yeah, and then, like I said, with the last little build points, I couldn't fit in, I would have loved to fit in Iron Golems to be like a bat seeker, but I kind of thought I'll, I'll just rely on summoning, summoning them in. I went for the <clears throat> Palisade just to block off an area just to be annoying mm -hmm. I can either block off like, after I summon the iron columns on just to give them a bit more protection or protect you know this castle or the manticore can do it to protect himself or to screen anything that I need to I think it's quite a nifty uh, in a spell yeah it's, it's great I've used it low. I've, I've even used it in states of darkness quite a bit it's great. It's great for screening, right? Like that that's what I use it for. Like you said, Jamie, you know, you can screen, you can stop enemies shooting a bit with it, you know, you can do all these sorts of things, you can do board denial. The only thing I'd say when you set it up, remember that things within six inches of it, at the start of every turn you roll a dice on a five up, if it's within six inches of it, um, and you roll a five up for that unit it's minus one to hit. Just remember that bit, because that <laughs> sort of glossed over that, <laughs> and then I was like, oh, my Varian guy minus one to hit. Damn it. But you make the enemy minus one to hit, right? Because this doesn't move this endless spell. It just stays there. I've used it to, literally, I've had it so, uh, better core, uh, put it up to try and block some 40 Saurus, guard, uh, 40 Saurus warriors going onto an, an objective, right? He put it up, to bugger up their movement, and then he flew onto that objective he was going to stop them taking. And because this, the enemy couldn't unbind the palisade, 
and the enemy spent ages trying to get around it, better could hold that objective for two turns, whereas the enemy would have held it for two turns. So, it, you know, it just shows where it can be super useful. And 30 points is a number I often come down to. So, out of interest, does that, that put you on 1970 points, right? Just to be sure. Yeah, yeah 1970 right. came up on Midas Builder. So, what, out of interest, what was the reason for the Palisade rather than the um, Realm's Gate Rapture? Which is their uh, rupture, which is you know the end of spell for slow startness, which is just like the spikes in the ground that just go in one direction. Because you could have. Yeah, I, I definitely thought of bringing that in. About it. But that that kind of would go then up to two thousand points. And I kind of feel like nineteen seventy, you're at the good point, or maybe getting a triumph as well. Yeah, you're. Like, and I kind of felt like to. I kind of wanted the protection a little bit more. Than the inner spell going forward, even though it's a great inner spell. Yeah, that's it, 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 it does kind of feature in the, in the future list, I imagine. Yeah, that 100%, um, which we'll get to later. But no, uh, that's one of my favourite spells, uh, Palisade. Uh, definitely, I think I actually own two of those models, thinking about it. Own two and a painted Neva, but that doesn't matter. Um, it's, it's a cool looking model, right, as well. Um, but the only other thing I want to say for your list, it's so my list was uh, three drops, Jamie. So I don't know if you got the memo, but you know your list is ten drops, right? <laughs> so no, I've got, I'm kind of settling for not having the first turn. No, and what I would say, right, is that I I think the Slaves Darkness Battalion that I took is cool, and I think obviously it's better if you can choose who takes the first turn. But I never really aim for it. I never really aim for. Go, I have to have the first turn because. I, because then that limits on what I can take and what I can have fun with, right? So I'm never really too worried about drops. I never really presume I'll get to choose who gets to go first. And like you say, Jamie, if you've got that mindset, if you know how you will take... If you have to go first, because you won't have the choice, if you know how you are going to proceed, great. If you know that you're just always never going to be able to go first and you just always have to prepare to go second, you know how to castle up or, you know, prepare for an alpha. Because that, that block of 40 more is going to easily be a huge screen. Oh yeah, definitely. I can definitely, definitely be a huge wall of protection there. But any like alpha striking. Yeah, so um, anything else you want to say about your list? I think that's, I think that's pretty much it, isn't it? All right. I think that's pretty... Yeah, I think that pretty much goes over everything, went over all the client chains. Yeah. And again, it kind of Oh, just to I say would have liked to build a battalion for it, but I think anyone maybe looking at Ravengers, <laughs> you you want command points if if you're yeah. going for the summoning on there. Yeah, but but Jamie, you could have taken the War Shrine Battalion. I think maybe <laughs> maybe <laughs> I think you could have terrible terrible battalion. Never take it. Um, but with that, I would just like to say one more thing. Chaos War Shrine, yeah, it's good from see for its press. Also gives you that bubble, doesn't it? Of holy within 18 inches of it, you get your mortal wind save. Or wind save, which is, it's on a 6, right? You get that damage prevention save. It doesn't sound huge. Um, when I've been running war shrines before, it really, really can make a big difference. Because um, you're so used to thinking like a lot of your stuff's got more wind saves in this army. As soon as you come to taking wounds, uh, you realize you can't negate them. It can really hurt. So Yeah, it does, it does make it um Certain you know, if I run up with Marauders, they do a lot of damage and then finally die. And I've got a unit of Chaos Knights with a War Shrine sitting on an objective. They're going to be quite hard to shift off. You know, the Knights are going to have a free up save, and like I say, they're going to have the, an after damage save as well from the War Shrine. Yeah. No. And then they're going to take a while to get through their 10, uh, 15 wins. Uh, for what? For the Chaos War Shrine? The Knights. Oh, the Knights. There's five of them, yeah, so it's 15. Yeah, 15. Yeah, yeah we have a three-up save. Three-up save, and then a five-up, obviously, mortal wound save. Or, if it's not mortal wounds, and it's just normal wounds, a uh, six-up. So. Yeah, and awesome. I've seen you roll plenty of uh, six-up death saves, which have been annoying in the past. Yes, yeah, so obviously uh, Asian Nagash are always running the uh, the Death Armies when it when it's not Slaves of Darkness. Um, and 
I can't tell you how many times death saves have saved my life. I literally think, and Jamie may agree with me here, that I, I'll ha let's say I've got a four up save, right? I will roll worse on my four up save than I do for my death save. Let's say I've got ten saves, right? I have to roll, and I'm saving on fours. And I fail, I don't know, let's say seven of them, right? So, and then I'm rolling these seven dice going, hope I get my death saves, right? And then I could roll them and I might get four sixes or something. Like, you know, just like really, really good odds. Um, which I um, which, which is great because it, it really carries over as um, people in my Discord are being very annoyed when they're playing against me on TTS. Uh, so it's all, all good fun. All good fun, I think. Um, but no, that's cool. Uh, yeah, so with that, we'll move on to the next list. So now going on to the Kabul list. So I'll be starting off going through my list first and then Jamie will go through his like we did for the Ravengers. So firstly, in my list, what we'll have is going to be a Chaos Sorcerer Lord on Manticore. He is going to be my general. He is going to have the command trait, the Blasphemous Influence. He is going to have the Mark of Chaos of Zeech. And then his spell is going to be Mask of Darkness. So remember, that's the teleport spell. We're then going to have a Gaunt Summoner on Disc of Zeech, who is going to have the spell Mask of Darkness again. And you may be wondering why if I just duplicated that, it's because the enemy is going to try and kill your hero that can teleport something. So if you've got it on two things, it just creates redundancy for your enemy to have to try and deal with. And then we're going to have a Chaos Sorcerer Lord on foot, who again is going to be Zeech, and then he's going to have his spell Binding Damnation. That's the way to try and make the enemy fight last. And then we've got Bellacore with his spell Whispers of Chaos, and this is going to be the spell that you make the enemy, basically you pick an enemy unit within 12 inches of Bellacore in this case, roll a dice to each model in that unit, on a 6 they take a mortal wound, if any models in that unit are slain, that enemy unit cannot move into your next hero phase, which I honestly think, depending on the army you're fighting, is it's definitely one of the top 3 spells they have in their spell lot, and could... It's like could be very close to how good that teleport spell is and usefulness. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah, it's definitely one of the good ones. Yeah, it like I used it recently against I nipped Deepkin and I just used it on a block of Namati and he double turned me and that block he had didn't move for two turns. And that is one of the factors of why I won that game. Like it was just so powerful. And then we've got a Slaves of Darkness Demon Prince. He's gonna have the axe because I just think minus two render is always fun. Um, and then we're going to have the Artifact Infernal Puppet, which is useful. And what that does is, basically, once per battle in my hero phase, um, I can pick one enemy wizard within 24 inches of the bearer and is visible to them. In the next enemy hero phase, each time that wizard attempts to cast a spell, they suffer D3 mortal wounds before the cast and roll is made. If the wizard is slain by these mortal wounds, the cast and attempt fails. So they do not roll dice. So this is great, especially in the meta at the moment. Going against Lord Croak, going against Teclis, going against Arcan, going against um, Marathi. Any of these? Well, I suppose Marathi is not too important because you can only take so much damage, the little bitch. But <laughs> I think against the main threats out there, especially Seraphon, um, it's going to be huge because uh, Croak is so can be so difficult to try and deal with and try and win against, especially if he's just mortal wound output of his spells and everything else he does so being able to say to him right basically you can't cast this turn unless there's a chance you can take a lot of damage he'll probably just put his cast into summoning points instead but still you prevent him from casting and then you get better core next turn or whenever you want to make croak not cast again with his uh, better core basically special boy ability so that is good, and he is the mark of Zeech as well, the Slave Titan's Demon Prince, which means that his command ability will let me get plus one to cast for one of my wizards. It is 50 points if you look at it that way, like a command point, 50 points to just get plus one to cast, but you never know, it may really be useful, especially if you're putting it on Bellacore or Gaunt Summoner um, on Disc of Zeech. It means that they're casting two spells each, so it could be worth the command point. So, then going on to my units, I have got, I would say, the uh, local hero and a hobby heroes option of 20 Chaos Warriors. And they are going to have hand, weapon and shield, and their mark is going to be Zeech. And then we're going to have five Marauder Horsemen with um, Javelin and Shields. And then we're going to have the mark Zeech, we're going to also have another five Chaos Marauder Horsemen. 
with uh, javelins and shields marked as each. And then we're going to have 10 Splinter Fang, which is the uh, Warcry Warband, which is all about snakes and stuff. You know, that one looks quite gladiatorial. And then we're going to have a few uh, Ender Spells. So we're going to have the Darkfire Demon Rift, which is the one where you've got like that demonic face just spewing lava, which we've me and Jamie have reviewed already. We've got the Realm Scare Rupture, which is the one with all the uh, Chaotic Metal, metal Spikes coming out of the ground, which again we've reviewed. And then we've also got the Gemnids of Olgish, and then I have got an extra command point, and that puts me at 1980 uh, points, so in a chance of a triumph. Right, so I'll be completely honest with you, this list is either very hit or miss, and it's something I haven't tried out, and I will say there are better ways to run this sort of list, but this is what I came up with without having um, experience with this list and it's something I want to try so I'm sure you guys in the comments can probably come up with a better list and I'll be happy to hear about it because the idea of this list is essentially castle up I castle up my wizards being protected by the 20 chaos warriors move up the board I start casting all of these endless spells the endless spells do the mortal wounds to the enemy um, and Geminids can debuff the enemy as well as we know and Realmscare Rapture can also be board control used against the enemy. And the interesting thing is the Darkfire Demon Rift basically can do D3 mortal wounds to enemy units that flies over or lands within an inch of. But also it uh, does an all, uh, extra mortal wound for how many other endless spells or wizards are within 12 inches of it. So that means suddenly you're adding a lot of mortal wounds on as I have four wizards in my army and then I also have um, three ender spells in my army or maybe just two ender spells because I can't remember the dark fire demon rift counts itself so I presume it doesn't so suddenly that is six extra mortal wounds you could be doing which and that's not and that's not taking into account of whatever your enemy might have mm -hmm. exactly most armies you go against will have at least one wizard um, I find even if it's just like something I've came off across a lot against order armies, it's even if they're not caring about casting spells, but they'll just have a knight encanter, the stormcast wizard, just for the automatic unbind. Um, yeah, that'll be useful against me because I want to cast a lot of spells. However, that's a wizard I'll be using to do more wounds back to them. And I would just say the whole idea behind this as well is if we go back to my chaos sorcerer lord on Manticore with the Blasphemous Influence, what that does is it gives me my um, Ritual Corruption goes off on a 2-up instead of a 3-up. And me and Jamie, like we said when we talked about the Ravengers, we have also reviewed the Kabbalists. So if you want a long in-depth discussion about actually the sub itself, go check out that video. But just to give you a summary, the Ritual Corruption. So pick one friendly Kabbalist unit within 3 inches of a wizard performing this binding ritual and roll a dice. On a 3+, plus, the ritual was successful, and D3 models from that unit are slain. Then pick one pretty endless spell within 12 inches of that wizard. If one model was slain by this ritual, you can move that endless spell up to 3 inches. If two models were slain by this ritual, you can move that model up to 6 inches, and if three models were slain, you can move it up to 9 inches. And obviously the Dark Fire Demon Rift is going to be the chosen one I'm going to pick of this. And it just means that even if I take priority and the enemy tries to move this out of the way or use it against me, the Darkfire Demon Rift, or the other spells, they'll probably go for the Gemmids. If they do go for the Gemmids, for example, then I get to pick my Darkfire Demon Rift. And this is all if I get the priority. If I don't get the priority, then I'll go Demon Rift first. And then in my Hero Phase, I'll be doing it again. Because these rituals, you can do it once in your Hero Phase. And you pick one Cobaltus Wizard to perform it. So, for example, uh, if I take the priority and the enemy moves the Geminids, you know, as they're going second, they get to move the first end of spell. And then I move the Dark Fire Demon Rift. And then my turn, I get to move it again. So I'm doing it twice straight away. Which, like we just mentioned, is practically, if I have everything else in range, that could be... Uh, D3 mortal wounds plus seven. My master's correct. No, D3 mortal wounds plus six, sorry. So it could be up to nine more wins for each of those enemy units within range. Which you can kind of see where I've gone with this list. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, with the Kabbalah, the Kabbalists, you've got the two different rituals, and my list are kind of wanting to go the other way. Yes, exactly. which I think, I like, I honestly, like... But it's a good thing you have, you've got the option, haven't you? Mm. Now, what I just say, sort of like to, to finish off my list, is that we've got the 10 splinter fang. Why have we got those? So they are the ones to sacrifice because you can kill the snakes from that uh, unit. At least just kill that one. And then you've got a snake charm in the unit to try and bring a snake back and I believe your next hero phase. So that means you can kind of replenish that unit. So that's why the splinter fang are useful. This is something that uh, Jamie told me a long time ago when the book first came out and uh, remembered since because it is a very useful thing. Um, you also do get a spell from uh, this Kabbalis, uh Sub Allegiance, which is Crippling Ruin. And essentially what that does, you make an enemy take D3 free mortal wounds and then for how many mortal wounds they take, you subtract that from their movement characteristic. Uh, until your next hero phase. So you can see how you can really debuff the enemy here. I'm also going to be casting um, one from the Chaos Sorcerer Lord, two from the uh, Gaunt Summoner, three for the one on foot, five, six. So I'm casting seven spells here, right? And that's before the Gaunt Summoner brings on some pink horrors, for example. They can cast a spell as well, but obviously not a massive spell, but they can cast one as well. So that's a lot of magic potential. Um, but obviously, a weakness I've got going on here is my uh, everything else. If I don't get my plan off of casting up, moving into the middle, doing all my damage through mortal wounding spells, I'm I'm a bit screwed because uh, my 20 Chaos Warriors aren't going to kill a lot. They're just there for defensively. Uh, and my Slaves of Darkness Demon Prince and Bellacor and the Chaos Social Lord and Manticore are the only three things that can kind of fight. The Demon Prince is the best out of them, I would say. It's not going to be enough. So I really am quite dependent on getting this magic off. Which means if I go against a croak list, although I said like, oh, I'm going to do Bellacore, I'm going to do the Infernal Puppet on him. It's still not going to be great because it's going to be hard for me to get my magic off. But um, like, you're not always going to be fine against those armies at all. Um, I'll be fine against it quite a bit because I've been practicing for like tournament practice. But apart from that, it's okay. The reason why I've gone for two years of five Marauder Horsemen is just because I, I can't afford not to because I just need some movement because if I'm going to be so castled up, I need to have some tactical units flanking just to take objectives or something. I really need that. The other thing I can do with this army, which I quite like, is if you're going against an Alpha Striking army, as an example, um, you can, and, they, and they're going to take the first turn, let's say, or it's a gift from the heavens where you don't know the objectives are, something like that, or you defend an object in your own territory, you can castle up quite nicely in your own territory with this, um, which I quite like. Uh, you always you should always have a command point for inspiring presence for the warriors, so they won't be running away that way. Um, what else do I want to say? And yeah, just while I was going back to a minute or two ago, the blasphemous influence, the reason I went for that command trait is just because I really want to get the ritual corruption off i don't want it to be like oh i've got 60 percent chance getting it off no i want 80 percent chance i is it 80 at that point no it's more than 80 isn't it uh i want to make sure i get that ritual off i don't want risk it may seem like sacrificing a command trait just to get plus one to that role i know for someone myself who i've played i dodge uh idolators which was the sub allegiance in broken realms from raffi for um the Slaves of Darkness, which we'll get a list to that coming later in this video. I took Chaos War Shrines in that, and I can tell you from War Shrine prayers that normally go off on a three to now going off on a two made a huge difference. I can't tell you how many times roll twos. So I've learned from there how useful it was to hear. Um, and also with this, I should say, if we haven't mentioned this before, I think we mentioned it when we played, uh, well, not played, but we talked about the sub in that video, is I've played against not the same list, but a, a similar, a list with the similar idea, which uh, you ran yourself, Jamie, against my Oshrich Brain Reapers, that did, it just wipes out Mortec Guard, didn't it? The, uh, the normal uh, OBR infantry. Yeah, you, you so mortal wounds are definitely good against, like, like say, your Bone Reapers, Dawncast Eternals, things that don't have, you know, good mortal wound saves. I'll tell you what, even um, Iden F. Deepkin now, which uh, Ishlin are 
amazing like they can be on two up save with rolling one unrendable. But mortal wound save, if they're not in range of their ship, they're screwed. So otherwise you, you just can't go against them. So well you, you struggle. So yeah, that's that's the idea here. And it's um it's it's hit and miss. Like it's not it's not solid. I still this saying it now, reading through it, there's still things I want to tweak, but it's something I want to try out. I think um what else I was going to say with this, I think it's going to be um, capitalised in your list, Jamie, of what I am going to say. But I think Cabalis could be one of the strongest sub-allegiances for Slaves of Darkness. Doesn't look at it when you first read it. But if you can get a lot of your spells from the lore off that go off on sevens, which is hard, which Jamie's list is going to help you with, it means you can make the enemy not move. You can make the enemy fight last, you can teleport, you can half the enemy's movement or subtract from the enemy's movement. There's so much you can do in this by debuffing your enemy that I think it could be such a tactical list. Like, I think Cabalus could maybe be a list with quite a high skill set, if you know what I mean, Jamie. Yeah, and obviously it's got two rituals. Obviously you, you've talking about one, which are like your focus is on. I tell, other, I'll tell you what, we'll, 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 go, you, we'll go you on to your access, list, Jamie. Yes. We'll go on to your list, shall we? And then, because uh, I know you, you've got that, haven't you? So we'll go into your list, if you're yeah, good. Yeah, it's like the same thing to you. My list, I was still thinking, thinking that up, up of changing, and like I say, there's still things that you'd maybe tweak. So like my general is the Chaos Lord and Manticore. Yep. Because I kind of, like my whole not, this whole allegiance, apart from Bellacor, I've included Bellacor as well. Uh, it's hard not to think he's a two-cast wizard. Mm -hmm. But we're like, with Nurgle, their uh, general, you know, if you're in range of the general, it's minus one the hit and shooting, which is a nice way to kind of move up against shooting armies. Yep. At the same time, like I gave that to my Chaos Lord on Manticore, because he's got a big base, he's going to take a lot of the fire, and he's going to be moving up the board. But then the same kind of command trade that you've taken, I would consider taking the other one for the two plus ritual to do the same as what you said. You kill, you roll D three, kill whatever many models happens on a D3, but the other ritual is for each one that's dead, you get plus one to your casting. Yeah. So you could be plus three to your casting. Which is, bear in mind... Yeah, the, the only reason I didn't choose it is because I wanted the council of the Manacle to be the general, and I didn't want to leave him behind. Because I, I was thinking of making... So I've got... Chaos Sorcerer Lord on foot as well, who I was considering making a general and kind of being on the backfield, but then you're kind of losing out on your general ability. So that's the kind of thing, either you got to move, I've, I've got a splinter thing, so I'll go through the whole list. Mm -hmm. I've got Bellacore as well, two cast wizard, just an awesome character. And he's got Fantastic. Binding Damnation for me. So that's the fight last one. Yep. Uh, I've got the Chaos Sorcerer Lord. He has Mask of Darkness. And also I gave him the artifact of Infernal Puppet, same as yours. The artifact that you've chosen. It, I'll just say pretty much for the, it's pretty one much of the, for the same reason. The yeah. The only other artifact is worth calling out, in my eyes kind of thing, is... The Scroll of Dark Unraveling, which is use up that artifact to auto unbind. Yeah. Which can be situational, but it's still a good one. It, or, like, if I give you a scenario of. Uh, I don't just want to use Croak all the time, but he is essentially the be best cast you've got at the moment. If you better call him. And like, I really need him to just basically not do anything this turn, and he's still with the term to cast. Uh, if he manages to get that five up, and it's like the Bell in Vortex as an example, where he gets on there and then it's Croaknado, you just go unbind that spell, and and it doesn't matter. Like, oh, I casted it on a fifteen, don't care. 
Yeah, okay. or someone like Tetlis who does the big aura bubble of yeah. like Phil No Pain. You can just automatically unbind that because obviously he can pretty much auto cast it. But that, that's like the other one I, I kind of feel like it's cool, worth calling out. That's I it. went for the Chaos Lord on Metacore. He's got an awesome spell. Beefy, pretty decent in combat. Yeah. I gave him the extra two wounds. But like I say, it's also worth maybe thinking to try and get your ritual off more successfully. Like you said, three plus is good, but a two plus. A two is plus will almost scare you. Can a three plus you can never rely on it. A two plus you can. That's how I look at it. Yeah, it's a lot more reliable. And then I, I, I've got a chaos lord on demonic mount. Nice. As a bit of a beat stick. Yeah, he's pretty good. Pretty good. And then a little called out for I got Phaedra the Skull Scryer. Nice. Different. And a little little war band. Goes but actually she's actually quite expensive. But she has to come with her uh, Glossworn Hunt. I kinda of thought of it as the Glossworn Hunt I could sacrifice as well. That's true. Not obviously not the dog, but yes. Oh yeah, you know that'd be kind of wrong to to kill the I mean, dog. You know, like, I know chaos is not seen as the good guys, but you know they do have some standards. The RSPCA doesn't come knocking at their door, from what I know. But she, I gave her the whispers of chaos. Yeah, great spell. And um, my chaos or the manticore, I've got to say his spell. I gave him the ruinous vigor. So ruinous vigor is the one where yeah. you cast it on a monster, so himself. Yeah. And you treat your damage table as taking no wounds. Which is good for, obviously, the Manticore's attacks. Because the Manticore's attacks aren't no joke anymore. They are quite, pretty good. Um, but also just movement, I presume. It's like, well, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Okay. if you really need him to get somewhere. You know, he's, he's pretty fast. But then, yeah, like I say, also like in combat, the Manticore is pretty decent. And I've got a cheeky another monster in my list at the end. Nice. So, units for battle line, I've gone Chaos Knights with swords, Chaos Knights with spears, Lord of Horsemen with javelin and shields. And then I've also got, I'll say, the Gosworn Hunt to go with Phaedra, Splinter Fang for the same reason as you, as some sacrifice. I've got Iron Golems as a cheap tank, yep. for some protection on the backfield. I've got a Chaos War Shrine, Nurgle, but I love the prayer for plus one to the assay. And I've got a Soul Grinder. Good old Soul Grinder I thought I'll include in him. And the main thing I thought about that, I, I was going to say after my spells. So my spells are included, some endless spells. Realm Scourge Rupture, great spell. Your opponent can't fiddle with it either. Because it can only move in one direction. Mm -hmm. yep. And I've got the Chronomatic Cogs. To either give me more speed or give me an extra casting. Which is which is great. And obviously Especially for about... like the Chaos Sorcerer Lord where his inbuilt spell is awesome. And then obviously the spell law you got some really awesome spells in there. And sometimes it's hard. It's, you hate having to try and pick what you want to do and what you don't want to do. Yeah. But like the combat, I, I did look it up. The Count of Sorcerer Lord spell. Uh, oh, I forget what it's called. Uh, Last one five. Reroll hit rolls and wound, wound rolls. Yep. It doesn't say in melee. I'll put that on my soul grinder. And hopefully he gets some good shots off. All right, that's yeah. Think about it, yeah. That's pretty good. And shooting in Slaves of Darkness though, I mean, like quite quite unheard of. I mean, he's when we reviewed him, it's not bad shooting. No, and he's alright. But combat. when you get to yeah, and also yeah, he, he's pretty good in combat. And also I've got the spell Ruinous Vigor in my army, in which obviously if he does start taking damage. Well, 
treat him as if he hasn't taken damage and he's at full health on his... I think it only affects one... Yeah, it only actually affects one of his cannons and his piston-driven legs. But when you look at him from saying he's taken 11 damage, when he's only got three attacks or six attacks, I'd rather have six attacks. Oh, definitely. And the other nice thing about him is that he can run and shoot, which is quite nice. Yeah. So, there's definitely some tactics in there for, like, the Count's War Shrine, I think, is a great, especially for Nurgle. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, people ask me, is a Chaos War Shrine always an auto include? And I say no. But when you're playing Nurgle, yes. Yeah, I think, because. Well, my idea for the army is the Chaos Lord on Mount and the Chaos Lord on Manticore can lead kind of like a vanguard of Chaos Knights up in the front with the War Shrine in behind and like the Soul Grinder probably following up behind doing some cover shooting. Mm-hmm. Obviously like Bellacore would be going up as well. And then kind of like that's mainly like a distraction and then the Moral Horseman can go and take objectives and I can teleport something else onto other objectives. Yeah. But people, that sounds fair. You do tend to find people don't like big stuff on the battlefield. Uh, I definitely would feel like, like the Chaos Lord on Manticore. People know about Bellacore. Not many people know about the Soul Grinder. But if you get some if you get some good rolls off, people are going to want to kill him. Yeah, and that's... I mean, like, honestly, um, there'll be times where... Obviously, if you're playing against a very competitive and uh, experienced player, they're going to know that that soul grinder is good, but, like, it's not the main threat. But if you go against, you know, a lot of average people, if you deploy a slaughter brute, for example... Um, I think when I fought against a slaughter brute about two years ago at Throne of Skulls or something, I'd never fought against one, never really looked up his war score. And I was like, so to the corn player, I was like, is that good? And it's like, it's all right. And I was like, I want to kill it. You know, and it's like, it wasn't the thing to kill. But I was like, it's a big monster. You know, it just has that automatic distraction technique. Which... Yeah, yeah, one of those like stand out kind of thing. And I think when someone's got range as well, yeah, it helps. You always got some threat damage. You you really do. Like the soul gun is not the soul gun is not massive uh, range damage. He's got a one damage attack and a three damage attack, which when you're re-rolling increases your odds a lot. Yeah. And like in combat, like you said, it, it's not it's not bad in combat at all. No, is he Nurgle as well? Yeah, and the good thing about him is that they can have a mark, so he can be yeah. Nurgle, so in combat... Six is the wound. Six is the wound, doing an extra damage. Solid. Uh, yeah, I, I generally like that, I think it's cool. Also, things are a bit different as well, from what we see. Um, which I like, always like to see things that are a bit different. And I think uh, think it could work. I just like, something I, I didn't say for my Chaos War is like... The other reason, like, a question of, like, why did I go Zeech is, um, I'm chucking so many spells and Ender spells out there. Uh, my guys will have a five up save against the Ender spells from the general. So that's, like, a sort of an idea there, what I'd have, because Zeech is. I would. My personal opinion on what are the strongest marks is. I'd say the weakest are undivided, definitely. Zeech, and then probably Sinesh, Corn, and then Nurgle. Like from weakest to strongest, I'd probably say are the marks. So I wanted yeah. to try and do something with Zeech. Yeah, featuring. I, I, I do kind of agree with that statement. Obviously, a lot can be said for the first three. You know, they all have their own little plays. I think Zeech and Undivided are a bit more harder. They don't have standout buffs, do they? Well, I'll I, I tell you a problem with like with, with Zeech, right? And this is like a, li- a little thing. It's 
So, if you go Zeech, are you going to be taking care of Sorcerer Lords? Yes, right? You'll be taking them in Kabulis. So, your generic mark of Zeech of reroll and save rolls of 1 now feels a little bit silly because your Chaos Sorcerer Lord can make that unit reroll all failed save rolls. It just. Zeech wasn't. I don't think Zeech is written as well. Like, it just doesn't get as many benefits as um, Nurgle. Where Nurgle, for example, uh, yeah, you might as well hit from shooting, and then you've got uh, your Wound on Sixes, does the extra damage. But then if you go to the War Shrine, the uh, War Shrine ability will make you plus one save and then reroll Wound Rolls. It just feels like it was written well for it. Whereas yeah, the, the, the Zeech War Shrine gives you a five, uh, the Zeech War Shrine gives you a four up spell save, which just means that your five ups gone to a four up, and yeah, your reroll fail save rolls. It just doesn't work. The, like in the monster kind of video with the mm. with the War Shrine, is that the other abilities? It's like undivided. If they'd done that in a different way, the undivided prayer, which is a great prayer. Mm -hmm. But you can use it on anyone. Yeah, like... it's re-roll failed hits and failed wounds. Brilliant. But if you use it on an undivided unit, all you get is to re-roll your charge. Yeah, which is which obviously is good because you don't want to spend a command point to do it. But at the same time, if you got a three-inch charge anyway, or you know, yeah, obviously you can still fail. Exactly. But, but it's just like the noble one is clearly. You know, re-roll all failed win rolls, which obviously helps them with their ability of sixes to wound doing extra damage. And also it helps, because if it's a Nurgle unit, plus one save, <laughs> which is just Great, easily right? the standout thing. And uh, like you say, I wouldn't say the War Shrines are not on include, but with Nurgle, it's almost insane. Exactly, and I, I don't want this to turn to what the, the video of what mark is better because we've already talked about the marks and stuff in the other video. But I just thought it's an it's it always an interesting conversation, and one that it is changing. Like I think corn can definitely be give Nurgle a run for its money, and uh, I want to try and start playing Sinesh now and see how well I can do with that because I don't want to say they are the default settings of what is good and what isn't. I think it comes to the playtesting as well. Um, so, anyway, those are the Kabulis uh, lists, which are something a bit interesting, quite different, and I think it's definitely an army that isn't the easiest one to uh, play off the mark, but the more experience you get with it, I think you could really uh, make some armies that really muck around with your opponent's uh, battle plans. Like, this army is all about kind of... I say this army, I mean, this sub-allegiance is all kind of about uh, ruining your opponent's day. And I don't really mean that in like, oh, it's not going to be really, you know, uh, it's not a fun army to fight against. I mean, say so Starters aren't the strongest army. So if you can ruin your opponent's day and they're playing, I don't know, Seraphon or Dorsa Kane or something like that, good on you. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> to be fair, so it's all fine. So now looking at the, the spoilers. So this is obviously the Demon Prince heavy sub legions you can go for in your slaves of darkness if you like the demon princes and as me and jamie have already said we love the demon prince hence we're going to be looking at minus first which i'm going to call the uh, demon princesses diaries because it's got more than enough demon princes than your heart could uh, manage i think at this point because looking at the list so like we say it's going to be the spoilers we're going to have looking at the leaders we'll have a slaves of darkness demon prince who's going to be the general he is going to have a sword and it's going to be the command trait, the Paragon of Ruin. Which, again, if you want full details on the command traits and artifacts, go check out mine and Jamie's video about that. You'll see it in my playlist for Slaves of Darkness. But what this is going to let me do, is going to let me, before the battle begins, but after armies are set up, I can pick uh, D3. So you roll the D3, and that means how many you can pick. Units, and they can move up to 5 inches. Which, because it's a pre-game deployment, is a free, uh, sorry, like a pre game movement. It's really big, and we'll go to that in a moment. We'll just break down the whole list. Um, so he's got that as command tree. We then have another Slaves of Darkness uh, Demon Prince, and these are all going to be marked Sinesh until we have one that's corn. So we've got that's, that is Sinesh. We then have another one that's Sinesh, all with a sword, and then we have one that is corn. And you may be going, oh, well, the whole list 
is Mark Slanesh. Why have I got a Corn Demon Prince in here? And the simple reason behind that is because the Corn Demon Prince has the um, best command ability, which essentially makes enemy uh, run and charge rolls halved. So that means enemies can like fail three inch charges like a lot more easier, even if they're like Iron Jaws and getting plus one, yeah, they can still fail it. And it just gives you that much more board control. As in this list, we don't have the most amount of models, so we really want to get on top of board control. So we have that, and then the next one we've got is a Chaos Social Lord on Manticore, because in the, literally the last list we were just talking about the Kabbalists, we are talking about how important magic is in this army, and you don't really just want to negate it. So we've got him. It, to be honest, the Chaos Social Lord on Manticore is... I think very good for its points. Again, not getting any pluses to the cast here, so I can't rely on the spell power, but just the fact that I've got the spells as a threat to my opponent. He is going to have the um, artifact, the Helm of Many Eyes. So what that means is when my uh, Chaos Social Lord on Manticore charges, the turn he charges, him and his mount can fight at the start of the combat phase. And we're going to get into like who fights first at the combat phase in a moment, because it's a very big thing about this list. So then the next one we have is that, I believe it says auto-include in front of his name. We have Bellacor. And uh, yeah, I know, right? He's got the spell Mask of Darkness, which is the teleport spell we've talked about. And just to quickly say, the Chaos Social Lord, as you can see on the screen, has actually got the Whispers of Chaos spell. I'll just quickly tell you what that is. So that is where I pick an enemy unit. Um, that's within 12 inches of him, this basic range for that spell. I roll a dice for each model in the enemy unit, and for every six I roll, they take a mortal wound. If any of the models in that unit were slain, it's obviously not good against elites, but very good against hordes or just mediocre things with one wound or maybe two wounds, that means that that unit cannot move into my next hero phase. And that means if the enemy double turns me, that unit can't move for two turns, which has won me many games before. And then going on to the battle line, we're going to have two units of five chaos knights with cursed lances again i hear you people saying scrolled weapons are oh, they better they're just you know averagely standard better yeah i'm all about charging and i want the most exciting thing so i don't want to be boring so that's why we've got lances plus we're sinesh so we're guaranteeing our charges that's what i'm telling myself right okay <laughs> we've got 10 chaos warriors because chaos warriors are awesome am i correct on that one jamie you can't deny how awesome they look exactly <laughs> don't go into their rules they're awesome. But the reason why we've got 10 and not like, why not just two units of five ball control? Because I've got unit of 10, at least at the start, they're going to be re-rolling their saves. So it's still going to be a chunk for the enemy to deal with. And again, we'll break into that a little bit in a moment because I just want to finish off. And then units, we've got six Fury. So something a bit different for 100 points. And it's not really something people automatically take. So it's an interesting choice um, if I do so say myself. And then we've got the Realm Skur Rupture, which essentially is the endless spell which we've mentioned. That is the one with like the jagged spikes pointing out of the ground. It only moves in one direction from when you set it up, so the enemy can't really use it against you. It's not bound or anything, but it can only go in one direction, so it's great. Enemies take, oh, well, anyone takes mortal wounds if it goes like through them or it finishes next to them. But it also makes those units uh, half their move um, characteristic. So then with that, and then the Corn Demon Prince command ability you can see how it's all stacking in to really control the enemy's movement so they don't really do anything and there's 2000 points on the nose so you're not getting a triumph but to be honest i always forget my triumphs if anything a triumph i know they're good and i know they're worth it however just the sheer annoyance when you're halfway through your first turn and you forgot about it and you know you can't go back it's never worth it always go back to 2000 <laughs> so um now breaking down what this list is going to do so basically I'm not saying this list hasn't got much strategy, but it is kind of, I'm going to throw a bunch of Demon Princes in the enemy, they're going to have to deal with it, it's right in their face, and the Demon Princes fight at the start of the combat phase. So, if the enemy doesn't have their own version of fighting at the start of the combat phase, I am going to have four Demon Princes fighting, and Demon Princes, they're not like, oh, they're just instantly, they just wipe out whatever they're fighting, they're not. But they are pretty good for what they can do. I know you like them as well, Jamie. When we reviewed them, again, you go watch that video if you want a long review about Demon Princes. We know just how well they can do, don't we? Yeah, I was really happy when the book came out, how good the Demon Princes became. And they were the first thing that... Because I, I had one floating about. But I had, had no real use for him. Mm. And then you got the, the new War Scroll, new buff, and he was just awesome to use in the first game. Oh, so good, so good. What, what I can't get away of saying though is um, I don't know if it'll be up at this time of recording, it probably won't be, but I've got a part three of House Play Age Sigma coming up where I replay a 1000 point battle. 
and I, and I played the spoilers as one of the armies, and the Demon Prince was in two rounds of combat and didn't kill anything. And I don't know why. I just rolled nothing but ones and it was awful. <laughs> but ignoring that example, they're great. Just in case you came away from watching that video and watching this one. Don't, that was a lie. That was fixed. Right. But then that's why you have four. That's what, Exactly. Huh? That's why you have four. And you may be going, why go with the sword? And the reason behind that is, it's not because mine are all modelled with like blade sword looking weapons, obviously. The reason behind this is because if you get a six to hit with the sword, it's two more wounds instead of normal damage. And normal damage would be... Um, D3, which again, you might go, oh, well, you could get free damage, couldn't you? Instead of the two more wounds. So is the two more wounds, is that really, like, worse? Honestly, there's so many armies out there where if you don't have more wound output, you're barely going to scratch them. And even you go, well, I've got lots of rent, right? Good luck against Nighthorn and good luck against the Ishling Guard from Idenf Deep King. Those, not going to swear, but those uh, those bad boys <laughs> don't take damage too well, especially when they've got a two-up save, a re-roll in one. Unrendable. Yeah, you want... I think a lot of wound output is yeah, exactly. what you want. And now you've got four units, like just four demon princes, that have that mortal wound output. It's not loads, but it's just, it's there, right? And their claws are quite good anyway, demon princes. They can do quite a lot of damage. And even just like on its own, it might not be able to wipe out an enemy unit completely. But when you, if you want to just chuck four demon princes at something, and they're all going to be fighting before the enemy can fight you, brilliant. Plus, when you charge in the Manticore, that's fighting first as well. So you could fight if you charge those five units in. And again, with that pre-game movement, you can help move some of those units up. So if you want to do an alpha charge, I don't know if it's the smartest thing to do with this list. But if you wanted to do, you could maybe, um, it's going to help you to do that. Because you're Sinesh, you're going to be re-rolling those um, when on charge rolls. Uh, even if the Corn Demon Prince has to stay back a bit, that's fine. Because he's there, pardon me, for his command ability. And what you can do as well is charge in that Chaos Social Lord or Manticore. Like I said, if you get the Demon Prince as a win, that's literally five heroes that are fighting before the enemy can. And then the beauty of all this, Jamie, which I'm sure you're aware, is then it is your turn to pick a unit to fight in the combat phase. So you could fight with six units before the enemy hits you back. That's what everyone loves to hear when you say that on the table. Yeah, oh, oh, you're gonna make so many friends. <laughs> Especially if you do it to a Deacon player. This is the only reason why my army exists. I know, this is just like this is like a joke I did for my army. It's like I hate you, I know. Um so then that also means why we can afford to take things like Chaos Knights, um, because even if I charge all the other stuff in and then I charge my Chaos Knights in. It's like, oh, you want to attack the Chaos Knights first because they're good on the charge, otherwise they're, they're crap. You'll still be able to attack them first before the enemy can attack you back. Again, presuming that the enemy doesn't have a fight first mechanic, okay? Um, so you've got that, the Chaos Knights is, but also this is where we have the Furies come in because Furies, instead of fighting in the combat phase, can retreat like Skinks used to, but they move further and they can fly. So when you attack with all your Demon Princes and stuff, and then it comes to your turn to pick a unit, you pick the Furies, they bugger off and they fly over the enemy, take, I don't know, one of their objectives or something like that, and you've literally just charged them in as an extra movement and you use the combat phase as an extra movement and then they've gone absolutely across the board and claiming maybe an objective that was left behind by the enemy. So that is pretty much the sort of um, the tactics behind this list. Um, what was well, the command trait you went for? Command trait was um, Paragon of Ruin, so that means I can move D3 um, of my units at the start of the battle before um, the game's actually begun, when deployment And you done. went for the same one that I've actually gone for as well. Yeah, Although it's, these, it's really I do feel like there's a lot more better options for despoilers in terms of what artifacts are available. Yeah, so just a quick, I mean, like we have reviewed the spoilers, so again, you want full um, in-depth talk about it, go check that video we did, so that's why I don't want to talk too much about it but just so you know like why are we going so demon prince heavy right your demon princes um you roll a dice and you hear a face on a four up they heal d3 wounds your general if they're a demon prince they have an 18 inch range bubble for their mark of chaos aura i'm not going to explain what they are go check that out but first for uh for slanesh sixes explode and you get to reroll run and charge rolls and then the other thing is that the command traits can only be taken by demon princes uh, and also the fact of the um, the spoilers. Your general has a free up, no, a five up. Ignore wounds and mortal wounds. If he's a dimmer prince. Exactly, exactly. And so someone 
So when I came up with this list, one of the things I thought of was, um, oh, but, you know, if the enemy's just going to shoot you off the board, you, you haven't really got much. Because those demon princes, yeah, they're fighting first, and they've got a free up save, and they've got healing, and your general, like you say, can ignore damage. That's great in combat, but in shooting, right, you're going to get lookout, sir, maybe? Like, you know, that that's about it. This is where the difference comes in, because with the despoilers, again, you've got, like, the pitch black abilities, I believe it's called. So where you can basically, if you finish a move within six inches of a train feature, you can make it so it blocks line of sight. So um, Jamie's used this against me when I played Ostrich Bone Reapers and he just shut down my catapults. So you can, and now you've got four Demon Princes who can do this. And the other thing is, it's not a command ability. You can just do it. You're not spending a resource to do it. So you've got four models that can do that and you haven't got any shooting. Just be careful of your spells that require... Um, picking a unit that's visible. Apart from that, it's not really going to affect you at all. Yeah, and like with your list having four demon princes, you can really have some cover. If not, then the command trait I've taken from my one does help with the shooting. Yes, I, I did. I did consider that one, and we will get to that in a moment. But um, the other thing I want to say is actually a. Uh, because Bellacor is obviously a demon prince and he gets the despoilers keyword, he will be able to do this as well. So you've got, uh, just to double check, I have got four normal demon prince. How many demon prince have I got? One, two, three. Uh, so I've got three demon princes. Is that right? Sorry, I'm just looking at that. One. Three two. plus Bellacor, isn't it? Yeah, three plus Bellacor, so that's four. Um, so you've got better corp being able to make things pitch black as well. I'm sorry, I don't know if earlier I said I had four normal Dean Princes, sorry, just the three um, in case I did. But uh, yeah, better corp can do pitch black and better corp is healing as well. So like, on that four up. And the reason why you, you might go like, oh, you have, you've invested so many points into heroes. Why have you taken that Chaos Social or Manticore? You know, he's quite expensive. You know, he does the real saves and stuff. I think he's great. But why have I got him? He's also a monster. So on a four up, he's healing. So it's... It all does make sense, this list. It does seem like a bit like a meme list, you know, like we're just spamming like the Demon Princes for a laugh. I'll be honest, I haven't got loads of experience with this list, um, but I do think it has got some legs, because I think it looks like... And I, above anything else, I know when I sent it to you, Jamie, you said that looks like a load of fun. And it's, yes, it does look like a lot of fun. <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, I think this board is all... Up there is the strongest faction, or the strongest sub allegiance, so I say. I, th I think they're definitely one of the easiest ones to just read the book and pick up. Yeah. Cause they're quite straightforward. Very straightforward. You've got good artifacts, you've got good command traits, good abilities, and Demon Princes are generally strong. Especially, like, obviously, you've got Better Claw, who ignores Rend, mm -hmm. and now he's healing as well. Yep. And if an enemy unit flees a battleship test within 12 inches of him, I believe it is, he will heal as well. Like, you know, so he's got two ways to heal. And even that, he doesn't need to be alive to do his ability that's going to trigger your enemy. Not as in, you trigger their unit so they can't do stuff. I just generally mean mentally trigger their enemy into a breakdown. Even if they kill Bellacor, he's still going to do it. But your enemy will do anything to kill Bellacor just out of irritation. It's something I realise. I literally bait him all the time. I just make the enemy go and distract him and go and attack him because they hate him and it's like he's not doing anything now he's, he's already worth his 240 points i mean i'm happy to lose my spellcaster if that's going to send your strongest thing over on the other side of the board but um to take him out but with that uh i think that's pretty much it with the list is there anything you wanted to say with that jamie no it seems like it's uh no like saying we're not going for your meta kind of ways of oh, trying to not, yeah. go about it like, and it's all about, you know, still using, obviously using your the, the spoiler synergy to your advantage, but making it into a, like a fun list that people will, you know, you're going to have good fun and hopefully your opponent will have good fun playing it as well. <laughs> good fun. Right, here are my, what, what have I got at this point? Here are my five units that are fighting first. <laughs> what you no, think? It's that, not, I know what you mean. It's not scenario, like, isn't it? Yeah, as, exactly. And it's not. And I, I don't even mean it's that. It's that strong. And like you mentioned, Jamie, just in case like you're watching this video sort of halfway through, we did say at the start these are not the most competitive lists. They're just lists that me and Jamie think it's something that we would actually run in real life, and something that we think would be good fun, and something that you would have quite a fun game with you 
and your opponent against. Um, there's not just going to be like every list as Nurgle as an example because oh, I'll just be so fucking bored at that point. <laughs> but um, and if you're wondering, just a quick one going like, oh, I don't really want to buy that Demon Prince model this many times. Just convert them up. I know you've converted one, Jamie. You literally bought one box of a Demon Prince and made two out of it. I've got a Demon Prince. And it's not even the standard one. I'm looking forward to buying the standard one at some point. Like, I just made one out of a uh, kit bash out of Medusa and some other pieces. So, like, and I've got ideas of, like, two other Demon Princes I want in my head. Oh, yeah, there's, there's, there's so many good things. models out there that I've seen people convert up. And I'm sure there's other other companies that probably do good ones as well. Mm, oh, definitely. And the thing is... He, he is a bit of an older model. Yeah, I mean, but his his pecs though, his like and his waistline, poor, like he is, he has been doing he's, some he's been intense exercise. Out. Yeah, he like truly, but um, no, yeah. So there's lots of stuff you can do with them, and I think that's what we've mentioned before. So starting us, the law is so inviting to just you being able to uh, do much so uh, so much conversion potential. But anyway, without that's a whole different video that we've already talked about. So going on to the next list we're going to look at, and it's actually going to be Jamie's spoilers list. So Jamie. Talk us through the list you have, sir. Well, I decided to go full on corn. This yes. was like the first first kind of list that I remember kind of making. So I've got obviously Demon Prince as your general, and I gave him a command trait Lightning Reflexes, which is minus one to hit at range. Yeah, that's good. So like we were just saying not too long ago about if you're worried about your general being shot off, an extra minus one to hit. You got him within range for lookout, sir, because he's not a monster. He gets that too, so minus two to hit at range. It's going to take your opponent a lot of effort to try and shoot him off. Yeah, and then like even if they say it takes them an extra turn to try and shoot him off, then in that extra turn you move range of train feature and like a light bulb, you just well a light switch just go right off. You can't see through that train feature now. Yeah, exactly now. <laughs> I, I, I generally think it's got some good legs, this. So now I've got a second Demon Prince, uh, Bellacore, nice. uh, Chaos Lord on Karkadrak, and he has the Helm of Many Eyes, so the same as yours, Fight First. And I've got a uh, normal Chaos Lord on foot, coming in there for the filing in and attack twice command ability. Yep. Then my Chaos Lord on Karkadrak is in a battalion with two units of knights and two units of marauder horsemen in the champions of ruin nice mainly because i really i wanted a command point to start the game because there also there is the artifact yep. which is worth mentioning that can give you d3 command points but i kind of wanted my craft trap to fight fast on the charge so I was like, ah, oh, I'll center a force around him. And then I've got Chaos Warriors, just a small unit of five men to kind of like leave behind and be forgotten about on an objective. Yep. And I've got a fun, fun slaughter brute to bring to the party. Good, I mean, good chap. I mean, if you're going to take a slaughter brute, the spoilers is the one, because like we said, the healing potential. Yeah, the fact of... You can charge him forward, and you're healing D3, which is a cool bit. If you want to do more healing, there is a um, command trait that does that. Have there we is. gone over before? And I'm sure it's one that myself and you, when we were building the list for this video, we both considered when we were picking for our general, I imagine. Yeah, and that's a good one. I think the spoilers, they definitely have the better a definite of command traits and other things. Yeah, like I understand Ravengers not having the best command traits because everyone in the you know dog gets one. But um, the when I brought a battalion in Ravengers, I was a, a little bit struggling uh, sh struggling with the uh, with the artifact basis. Uh, when you when you can pick two, but anyway, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the spoilers. Um, yes, so you've got that. Yeah, because I kind of thought about. Like in terms of like tactics, the knights with the demon prince and the car drag kind of going up. Marauder horsemen are kind of like there for the flanking. Mm -hmm. 
and having that extra like D3 damage on a 2 plus on the charge for them could really help them if need be shift like back objective holders for, from your opponent yeah and the thing and, that... and it's kind of like a sneaky little thing of you know it's D3 mortal wounds so it's like you could go and use them to just do the mortal wound damage against those tanks which you said earlier What's D3 Mortal Wounds? Is it D3 on the charge? Oh, no, it's the God's Wands Champion Ruin. It's the one where your Clark Trap gets a fight in the hero phase. Oh, no, I meant uh, oh, Ruin Bringers, the cavalry one. Oh, oh, so we've gone. So is this Ruin Bringers and not God's Wand? Yeah. Okay, that's that's fine. Okay, yeah, so you've got, you've got that. Uh, cool, yeah, that's okay. Okay, so you've got that. So you've got the D3 Mortal Wounds on the charge. But it lowers, it lowers the drop. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Like, obviously, quickly, I'm just thinking. Like, how much cheaper is that? Because I'm just thinking what you can, what you could fit in as well. So, sorry, you you go on with the rest of your list. But yeah, that that was like the kind of thinking. I've got knights with lances, because we love to charge. I did use one set of knights with hand weapons, just so they can be a bit more. Better to bog things down with. Mm -hmm. And I totally forgot that you get the other artifact to having a um, battalion in which I would definitely take um, Diabolic Mantle. Although, although they do have some awesome ones. Armor of Torture Soul is a good one. Crown. Of hellish and adoration is good, but I would definitely um, pick diabolic mantle, which at the start of the first battle round gives me D3 command points. Because you're going to want to be, oh, I'm going to want to be using the corn demon prince just in case I lose um, the roll off. Yep. For that half the opponent's charging. I'm going to want the Karkadrak to do his, uh, if I win the priority, I'm going to want to be able to do the Karkadrak's ability onto my knights. Just like we've said over before, over the other army list, command points are very valuable for this army. they got a lot of good command abilities in oh, their they're, heroes. They're, they're, they're so valuable. So, like, if I can just quickly say, so, you know, like, you've gone for... Um... The Ruin bring a Warband, not the Champions of Ruin. So, did you actually pay for an extra command point as well? You no. You know, so what were you But giving me an extra artifact, I would definitely would take the Diabolic Mantle. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. Um, I think that's right. And I think what, what you do is you take the Ruin Rings Battalion, that's actually saved you 40 points. So, you've got 60 points left for your list. And what you do, buy an extra command point of that, and then you've got 10 points down, so you might still get a triumph. That's what I'd say to quickly just change that list. Yeah. Basically, you're, you're, gain a you're definitely going point. to want. You definitely want command points. You know, you've got the Chaos Lord for fighting twice, Carco Drak for the plus one <clears throat> to hit on the knights, yeah. and your Demon Prince to kind of help you screw up your opponent's charging. Exactly. And. That's almost like the the Demon Prince doing that is something that's just like, oh, I would say auto every turn, every turn doing it, every turn. So that means that that's burning command points all the time. And you might look at this and go, right, so you're starting with two, you're here phase, you're getting one. So you're already on three and then you're getting a dextra D3 here. Are you going too far on that? Honestly, I don't think so. Because there's all the other things we don't think about where it's like, right, need a five inch charge here. Oh, I failed it. I can spend a command point, but do, oh, do I really want to? I might need it later. You've got if you're starting the game with like five or whatever, bugger it, spend it. Yeah, I'm gonna worry. So yeah, and, yeah. Plus, and like, like we all know, D3 can be very. very you're getting sweet. you're getting one. Put it that way. <laughs> you're getting one command point. You're guaranteed one extra. Good. Yeah, I think I think that's good. And honestly, if I can have a um, save Zardis army where even if it's not in the spoilers and I don't get the extra D3 of that artifact. I can have a Slaves of Darkness army with an extra two command points at the start. Definitely. Absolutely definitely. It's like um, 
when I talk about when I run the Bloodmarked Warband and how I try to get that pay for an extra command point as well. So I'm already starting with like, you know, in my hero phase three. And the big thing also was starting with the extra uh, command traits as well. If the enemy goes first and they alpha you and you've got a battle shot test to make and go, you know, I don't really want to lose, uh, you know, like all my Marauder Horsemen straight away, just inspire them. So you've already got those command points to do that in terms of like this list as an example. So uh, yeah, I quite like that. And your 10 points down, so you've got you've got the triumph. Guys, as well, when you're watching this, you'll see the list we have up is the uh, one with the rune bringers in and stuff as well, just in case you go, on, well, it's on the screen. What do they mean? It's actually the champ. Yeah, don't worry. I've, I've put the, I fixed it. Don't you worry, chaps. Don't you worry. You can sleep easy <laughs> and not write anything in the comments. Right, so uh, yeah. So I know, I, th I think that's cool. It's also nice. It's different to my one as well, which I think is cool. But you can see like we've both played on the Demon Prince um, aspect of this because they're also, they're bloody good value. Bloody good value, those Demon Princes. Oh, they're very good value. They got fly. They move pretty quick. Free up save. They're tough with a free up save. Your general's got a five up after. Yeah, general's got a five up after. Healing. They're definitely what you build your army around. I, I would definitely say if you're going to spoil it. Exactly. The only thing I like is if they made a battalion that was all about demon princes. I don't know, it's like three to five demon princes or something. That would be like, they, there was one back in the day that had no points that meant that it was never played, but it would be nice if they actually didn't do one. Yeah, um, I'm going to have done one of all four of the gods. Yeah, that, that, that would have been good. Some, some gods better than others. I.e. The, the Sinesh one, you know, that's, you know when we talked about the battalions and talked about the Sinesh battalion saying this crazy idea how do you can like pile in 12 inches. Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't work because you need to pile into an enemy unit that's been three inches of it for the uh, <laughs> Chaos Lord command boost. So it's like, it didn't work, doesn't work. So if you watch that video, guys, apologies about that. But there was a dream there. And I think that's what we should capitalize on, the fact that a man can dream. Right, so with that, we are then going to move on to the hosts of the Ever Chosen. So this is a bit different, isn't it? This is essentially, you want to take our kill, take this one. There's an argument to be said to take our on in the spoilers which i think has some legs but if you want to take our on take him the host the ever chosen it's his own host jamie isn't he so you would take him in this right you can you can imagine not taking him in you would just be crazy yeah i mean like in the same way like let's say you're i don't know uh your local uh i don't know uh what's the best way to say this uh your local tip is a 30 minute drive away you don't have to take the car. You can walk and take all your rubbish to throw away, but you're probably going to take the car, aren't you? You know, it just makes sense. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at my list first as well. And this is a list I have played multiple times to the point where, like, I've, I've completed the list. I'm happy to move on to something else. Not that I've, I've got... Not saying it's bad to play, but it's just like I've probably played this list like 20 odd times. Um, so I have got a lot of experience with it. And um, so it's Allegiance, obviously, Slaves of Darkness. Um, Damn Legion, obviously, host the Everchosen. Six circle, because that means my Varen Guard in this list on the charge get plus one to their damage. And then having a look at the realm, it's going to be from Guy Ran. Looking at the leaders, we've got RK on the Everchosen. Obviously, he's the general, obviously. Because if he's not the general and host the Everchosen, then like you're missing out on everything, basically. Um, he has got the Aura of Chaos, corn. Everything here that can be corn is going to be corn. We've got for his spell, Binding Damnation, which is the spell to try and make an enemy unit within 12 inches of him fight last until your next hero phase. We then have Bellacor, who again, like the auto include, he's got Whispers of Chaos, which like for my Chaos Sorcerer Lord of Manticore on the last list I had, is to make the enemy unit hopefully not be able to move. We then have a Chaos Lord with Reaper Blade and Demon Bound Steel, which is basically he's there to make our Chaos fight twice. And then we have a Chaos Sorcerer Lord on foot. He is Mark of Chaos as each, because it can't be Corn. And the Zeech one is the best one for him because it just lets him re-roll so he rolls a one. So it can be quite useful to try and make him stay alive because I can tell you, in all the games I had, if the enemy had shooting, they go for the Chaos Sorcerer Lord dead first. So I can't make Archaon re-roll his saves, right? That's what he's in the list for. And for his uh, teleport spell, the Mask of Darkness. And then we have got, for my battle line, two units of free Varangard, both marked Corn with free um, End Sorcerer or and scrolled weapons, and then we've got 20 marauders with axes and shields, a mark of chaos corn, and this comes to a total of 1980 points, no extra command points, zero allies, and it's only 90 wounds. So the idea with this, and this is 
there's so much trial and error trying to find a list here because you if you want to take host the ever chosen list you really want to capitalize on your Archeon and your varying guard but there's so much uh finical uh what you include in your army and what you don't because you really don't have a lot of points left over especially when you include bellicor so this was the best way i found to make the most out of it because you've got Archeon, a powerhouse of himself and um, we've me and Jamie probably talked about him for about half an hour when we reviewed him. Probably something like that, at least, of all the things we can do. So if you want more information on our account, go check that out. But essentially, in this army, he can, and host the Ever Chosen, be able to see who is getting the next battle round, which is fantastic. Spends a command point, and that allowed me to win multiple games just because I knew what was going to happen, even if I knew my opponent was going to get the turn. Let's say I go turn one. I know my opponent has got um, the turn to priority, so they're going to double turn me. Sometimes I was just really aggressive and ran up and charged some of my things and what couldn't charge just ran as close as it could and the enemy in their turn one were like oh he's obviously got turn two I'm going to play really defensive and then it turns out they get uh, turn two and then they've mucked up themselves and then you know that and you've made them uh, make plenty of mistakes so like even when you know you're not getting the turn it was still really powerful when you knew you were getting the turn you could just play out a perfectly executed battle plan which playing as Archaon you think he would be such a great commander he would be able to use that sort of strategy so that's why it was great and um, even if you give the game away by showing what you're going to do and then the enemy's like oh okay you obviously have the next turn now it's like yeah I do but there's nothing you can do about it because I've double turned you bitch so that's basically what you've got um, you've got Bellica as well to see if the enemy's brought anything like Archaon or anything else that's nasty Bellica make sure that they can't play anymore um, so that's why he's good the Chaos Lord is to make Archaon fight twice. Honestly, Archaon can destroy so much as long as he's not going against Ishlin Guard. Um, they're making him fight twice as well for literally a, a command point, obviously, because you have to spend it. But Archaon is giving you an extra one in every hero phase. So that's going to be um, to your generating turn. You can afford to spend one on the Chaos Lord on foot. What I often found is I would spend another one on the Chaos Lord on foot to make him run six inches. So if I was doing like a turn one charge of Archaon, I'd run the Chaos Lord up six inches. He would then be wholly within 12 inches of Archaon for when he attacked um, in that combat phase. So that means he could make Archaon fight twice as well. So that's the sort of tech there. And then we've got for uh, my Chaos Sorcerer Lord. So yeah, he's got the reroll save rolls on Archaon. That's what he puts on. Honestly, there's so much things out there that are just going to target Archaon. It's ridiculous. Like when I went against... Uh, what are they called? Daughter Cain? They had the, I can't remember what they're called, Bloodstalkers. I think, you know, the shooty daughters of Cain ones. And the, the snakes that shoot you, basically. And they did 26 damage to Archaon um, in a single turn, which I thought was ridiculous. And that's the first time fighting against Daughter Cain. They did that to Archaon. And I can tell you, if Archaon wasn't re rolling his save rolls, this isn't the bit where I go, that's why he survived. No, if he wasn't rerolling his save rolls, he would have taken a hell of a lot more damage than that. So, like, it just goes to show how useful it can be. But it's also kept him alive multiple times. Archaeon, when you look at him, he looks indestructible. But the fact that he has not got a wound ignore, like he can negate mortal wounds, but he can't negate normal wounds, that is what kills him. So the enemy chucks bucket loads of dice at him, and he does just simply die. Because um, his way of healing is not fast enough. But if you can put this on him, you can keep him alive. And... When I was playtesting with this kind of list, I was thinking, do I really need real saves on him? He's got a free up save. He's got all everything else. Is it needed? It is, honestly, or he'll just die. Um, when he dies, your army goes to shit. So he needs to stay alive. There's nothing more heart-wrenching than when he dies quite early on. Uh, it's like you just know everything in your army is not going to perform as well as it should. And then the reason we've got the Chaos Sorcerer Lord with the Spell Mask of Darkness is because when our Chaos is up the board, doing having a good time and everything like that, and now he's no longer getting real save rolls because you're out of range of the Holy Within 12 Inches of that Chaos Sorcerer Lord on Foot. What you do is you teleport that Chaos Sorcerer Lord on Foot um, within range of Archaon in your hero phase, so then you can put the real save rolls on him as well. So that's why we've got it on him and not Bellicor. And then going into the battle line, it may just look like two units of free Varangar, but when me and you talked about them, uh, Jamie, I think literally we talked about Varangar for absolutely ages, because the tech that I have for them, and other people have probably done this as well, but... You go for the inscribed weapons on them. So just three models, but each of them are making six attacks each. So that's 18 attacks with your Varen Guard. You're going to be normally hitting on threes, but you're hitting on twos because um, Archaon is on the battlefield. And you're going to be re-rolling ones to hit because Archaon's aura for this Mark of Chaos is wholly within 18 inches of him, which is 
the majority of the battlefield when you look at it it's absolutely mental and um, because he's got such a big base as well so you're going to be rerolling ones to hit from that you've also got the host of the ever chosen ability where you pick an enemy unit and to your next hero phase you get to reroll ones to hit and to wound against it so in case you're not in range of Archeon's ability you've got that but anyway so you hit on so that's 18 attacks hit on twos rerolling ones you're wounded on twos because you're in range of Archeon for the plus one to wound from corn as well and then it's minus one rent and on the charge it's two damage and i cannot describe to you the amount of times in a good way that i would charge an enemy unit i would have 18 attacks and five seconds later i'd say to the enemy you have 18 save rolls and then the enemy would have five up saves and let's just say they failed 12 of them and then i just go that's 24 damage and even if that didn't wipe them out or i knew the battle shock would wipe them out I would go, I'm going to use my once per game ability to make my Varangard fight uh, again later this turn. And then your enemy then has to think, right, do I fight with whatever I have left against those Varangard? Or do I fight with what he's charged me with the other Varangard? So, like, I know I've been talking for a long time here now, Jamie, but you can see how that can be pretty darn good, can't you? Oh, yeah, when we were talking about Varangard, they can have such explosive damage. Hmm. Mental, absolutely mental. And don't get me wrong, when you go against Coalesced, who are the Seraphon who subtract one from all of your damage to a minimum of one, you're going to think it sucks because you might as well not gone six circle. But the reason why I think this is so good, and I know we talked about it as well in that video, Jamie, about Varangard. Honestly, go check that out if you'd like to hear more. It's because it's corn. And not those people taking corn Baron Guard, because everyone goes, oh, it's Nurgle, because then if you get a six to wound, then that's three damage on the charge. Right, as good as that is, I'd rather just go, I have 18 attacks, here are 18 save rolls. The, the effect of knowing how re uh, reliable this army can be by going, I know he's taking the next battle round, I know all my guys going to fight, my damage dealers, my Baron Guard, that they're getting every single one of their attacks through, unless you've got basically a minus one to hit, minus one to wound. The chances are, Sometimes I made the enemy only roll 17 save rolls, but still, it was really good. Um, and that's why you go and scroll weapons as well, because you're really capitalizing on the amount of attacks to get the plus one damage, rather than spears or something. Um, and it works really well. And to be honest, although Archaon is there, being like a big scary powerhouse, piling attacking twice and everything else, the Baron Guard is what dealt the damage every time. They were the ones who wiped things out more than Archaon did, and that might seem surprising the first time fighting it against a list like this, you might not know that. Downside to Varangard is, like I said, if Archaon dies, I'm now hitting on freeze, not re-rolling, wounded on freeze, not re-rolling. And then suddenly they go from absolute powerhouses to you're failing a lot of your hits into wounds. And, then... and that is why, like you say, Archaon is a massive target. One, because obviously he can be scary and, and be an absolute beast. But I feel like most people know that if they kill Archaon, your army kind of falls apart. Exactly. So yeah. keeping him alive, I think that's why people do go Nurgle, as we were seeing like my, my list over. Mm. It's like, yeah, well... We'll get to that in a moment, but obviously Nurgle, you can be a minus one from, from shooting. Like I said, most of the times when Archaon died when I played with him, it's because he just got shot to death. Be it by those snake ladies, or be it by skinks or whatever, or Bastardons, he got shot to death. Um, the other thing to say, or Salamanders was another one that killed him. But just to say as well, um, obviously with Nurgle, you take a war shrine, you can help him as well. But just to say with Korn, um, that's why the Chaos Sorcerer Lord on foot became an essential part like it wasn't like oh can i maybe put something else in this no had to be him so you've got anything else that can go toe to toe of archaon it's going to get better cord after that archaon's now re-rolling this three up save he's got a four up spell save he's got a four up mortal wound save and then he's got some healing so then sorry just to finish it off with the marauders so we've got the 20 marauders uh why we've got access and shields plus one to save and it's just generally i think the best attack um the reason why they're corn just makes them a bit more fighty if they get to attack. But, to be honest, they're just there to screen. They're there to screen and protect everything else in your army because you really can't stand your Varen Guard getting hit. Your Varen Guard, you might look at, oh, they've got a free up save and great bravery, so they're not running away. 
yeah, they die like anything. I charged three Vanguard into ten Handgunners. The Handgunners get to shoot you when you charge, and they killed, I think, one or two of my Vanguard. So, like, honestly, um, you really need to protect your Vanguard. And 20 Marauders, they can screen pretty well. You can make quite a big wall with them. Also, it's just a guaranteed charge in case you need to uh, charge them to an objective or something like that. It's just generally worth the 160 points. So we haven't gone all in on, on Marauders going like, they're, they're like a really kiddie thing as well. They can do some damage, but they are there just to screen and to just be some goddamn numbers because you have like really no numbers in this list. I've ran this list with three units of free Vanguard instead of Marauders and some other things were taken out, but you just don't have enough models. Um, that's, that's how I think. And, that's, and that's the other thing. Unless you somehow have the gold dice on, the, on your side and you can just kill your opponent completely, at the end of the day, it is an objective game. And if you can't hold the objectives, then you're going to lose. Yeah, I think like... Uh, so, some of my games, I won just because I hit the enemy so hard, they just couldn't recover. But I still relied on those Marauders taking things. Also, the other thing to say is, you're not taking Battleshock in this army, so your Marauders are staying there. They're like Bone Reapers at this point. When Archaon dies, you're taking Battleshock. That's why another reason why you've got to keep him alive. Um, and that's just why it's so important. But honestly, just like the reliability of knowing he's getting the next battle round, because you could go, right, my Vanguard only moved 10, and I definitely need them to charge to make the most of the sixth circle. You can literally just go, right, even if you want to spend a Command B, right, they're running six, right, they're moving 16, right, but they can't charge. It doesn't matter, because I know I'm getting the next turn. So you so you can make them move ridiculously far. You can like do the risk of, oh, do I run them and hopefully get the next turn? If our count's alive, you can see who's getting the next turn. And if you've got it, yeah, just do it. And like, uh, you know, you're going to hit the enemy and there's nothing they can do about it. And then, like I said, you're 1980 points, so you've got a chance again to get a triumph. Uh, Tickets to a tournament, every game forgot to use the triumph. So uh, try and remember. Yeah. Because it could be really, really good. <laughs> Always try and remember that. Exactly. Put a little marker down. Yeah, honestly, put a, like staple it. Uh, don't staple it to your forehead because you'll forget. But staple it to your opponent's forehead, and hopefully it reminds you. Um, so with that, um, I've, I've talked about my list for long enough. Have you got any questions and stuff about it? It's a list that I generally feel really confident in because I've played it so much. It's not like sometimes when I theory craft or I'm like I've played it a couple of times. This I've played. Th this is the most Slaves of Darkness list I've played. So I'm that's why I was managed to talk about it for so long. But anyway, um, plus you got an RK on. I've got an arcade, yeah, and it's like in real. Oh, if you ask, we're talking about real life games, Jamie. Haven't actually used them in a full game yet. Uh, but we're talking a simulated version where the arcade on is like half there and then half sort of faded away and chipped because that's how the, the computer downloads the model or however it works. I've played him multiple times. The real arcade on, not so much, but it makes me want to use him when he uh, when he comes out. And because I've got a Jamie knows what this is. I've got a conversion idea of how to get a crap ton of Varengard on the table. I may be running something like this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it could be good fun. But um, to actually do it in real life. And it's... Uh, it's um, I think the first time I ever played this list, it would just smash the enemy so hard. I was like, you know, fuck me. This is pretty, this is pretty strong. Um, I don't know if it's that fun to play against. But it's just because I managed to hit the enemy so hard. And then in, I think the next game I lost. And I was like, oh, okay, it's not actually too strong. It's like it either does everything or you you, you fail, basically. But most of the times it, um, it hits the mark and you do get your game's wins. But anyway, with that, I've talked about this for long enough. So, Jamie, why don't you take us through your host of the ever-chosen list? Well, that, that, there's no surprise on who the general's going to be. No, okay, I'll just at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've gone for the same... Heroes and you, although I decided to just to kind of be different. Although Better Call is such a, I'd say, pretty much like an auto include, I actually left them out. So I've got Archaon, Chaos Lord on foot, and Chaos Sorcerer Lord. I, I decided to go a different circle, although I think we both agree like the ship circle is probably the strongest. But as you can get the extra damage with. Six is the wound anyway of Nurgle. Like. Yeah, so I decided to go for the fifth circle, which is the fifth circle. You can re-roll hit and wound rolls for attacks made by fifth circle units if their target is a hero or a monster. Yeah, it's pretty good. But I've only included one unit of Varengard in mine. 
Okay. So, in that kind of thinking, would um, being the only ones who benefit from this fifth circle is that they would be used as the kind of monster hunters. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so that's them their to charge into monsters. Got yeah. And they don't need to be in range of anyone, they just do their thing. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. And even if you go, why are they... And it, and it means I don't have to worry about, obviously, you've got the will of the ever-chosen, the re-roll hit rolls of one and wound rolls of one ability at the start of the start of your turn, you get to pick a unit. It just means I could pick something else to be used and the fifth circle does allow me to just charge my Baron Guard into a hero or a monster. And they're re-rolling everything. I don't have to worry about buffs. No, so they can go off and do their own thing. And to be honest, if they're in range of Archeon, then Sixes to Wound are going to do that extra damage, aren't they? And it helps them. And just to say, like, when I talked about, like, you know, Nerva, you do get that uh, minus one to hit as well uh, for shooting. Like, if I was to say, when I boasted about my corn list, um, yeah, if, if the enemy had a lot of shooting, there wasn't really much I could do about it at all. So that minus one is going to really help you. Yeah, it's really going to help with um, our count survivability. Because, like you say, it's going to be a massive target. I, I've gone for Chaos Marauder Horseman as a, another battle line, Chaos Knights, and another Chaos uh, Marauder Horseman. To kind of be. They're kind of like screens as well as flanking objective grabbers. Because they can move just as fast, well, faster than everything else in the army. They kind of obviously stay in front of everything. So I, I can position my army as quick as I want. And the Chaos Knights are there for the extra damage as well. And now I've gone for Iron Golems to, because they're cheap. And to, something to leave behind. Oh yeah, Iron Golems are solid. And I think when you take in Nerva as well, Chaos War Shrine is quite hard to not leave out. So I've included the Chaos War Shrine yeah. in the list. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, plus one save. You know, Arcan with a two up save. And the re rolling re wounds as well, like. Yeah, re rolling wounds, That's the especially one you... for your sword if you're trying to put someone in the sword. Yeah, it's. It's crucial, right? I, I can tell you. So, like, the amount of times I've tried to put something in the sword, I've only put two things in the sword. I put a ah oh, a knight in canto, I they're called, on Dracoline in a sword. And I, like I said, I've, I've played with Arkham like you know twenty odd times. I put him in a sword, and then I went to put Marathi in the sword, and she was like, "Yeah, I only take three damage." And I'm like, "You've only take you're already taking three damage this turn." She's like, "Yeah," so I ignore it, and I'm just like, "Oh." I didn't yeah, want to swear. I didn't, I didn't want to say f off. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was not happy. <laughs> so, like, what I can tell you, though, the reason why I brought this up is because I actually fought against a Nurgle Archeon, and he put me in the sword straight away. Yeah. It <laughs> like, is <a> lot. <laughs> because he was re-rolling those wind rolls, so it really helped him. It's a, it's a lot uh, a lot more reliable way of trying to get someone in the sword. And, uh, and I th Did you do it? Uh, extra command point, I think, is pretty much... Not so much a given, but you want to start off with a command, an extra command point for the get ready to do the piling and attack twice, like for with the cow sword. Yep, because yeah, because you get the two a turn from Archeon, but that's that's not always enough. Like like we've said, if you can get that command uh, point in your army, do it. It's better to have too many than too few. You will never have too many. The only reason why you have too many is because you've forgotten to use them. <laughs> or you can use what gets better. One or two. <laughs> that's about it. Well, I included the uh, Prismatic Palisade as well for my. Yeah, that's cool. I, I've included that in the in Archeon as well because it helps again with the shooting. Yeah, and it helps block off things, and obviously Archeon can auto and bind it if, mm -hmm. if you choose with uh, one of his head abilities, which, it, which is just a great ability. Yeah, With like, something you can easily dispel. It's an easy way to dispel it, and then you can cast it again wherever you want. Well, I I fought against you know Kara's Fate Weaver. 
and and he uh, does some he does some nasty magic. I know me and you don't don't like him for another reason, but he does some nasty magic. And uh, he did a spell pull, and it's like wah ha ha. And I'm going to cast all my spells for it. He then, um, I think I unbounded the spell. He was going to go through it, and then it got to my turn. It's like right, I'm going to eat that spell portal now, huh? <laughs> like, <laughs> you're not even have to roll. It's brilliant. Yeah, it was, it's it's great. Um, and also, like you say, for, if you also want to recast the spells and get the most out of them, then you can do it. You can eat your end of spell and then reset up your palisade somewhere else. Especially and it's not costing I'll, you an okay, unbind. Um... I can but, cast two, can't I? Yes, yeah, so, but it's not because he's eating. But, it's not cast, costing you one of your casts. So, but it, it's good to include a, an inner spell in with Arcanon because he doesn't have an inbuilt spell. Yeah. So all he can do is Mystic Shield plus your spell law. So the spell law, I went for Binding Damnation for him, mm -hmm. just to make things fight last. Yeah, it's yeah. Help, build... Helps him out in the fact that I, I can pick something else and I can be handy handy Danny knowing he's going to fight first. Yeah, because the other thing as well, because um, then your Varen Guard can always fight first, like, as an example. And then you've got Archeon, if he's got that spell off, he can then uh, fight as well, knowing that he won't get hit first, as an example. Um, the other thing I'll say as well is playing against Deepkin with this on turn three. Being able to make an enemy unit fight last, which that means is it sort of just brings it up to uh, to par with you, so you can interrupt the deepkin always fighting first thing. So it's like even when you go against basically even when you go against enemy armies that fight first, if it's your turn and you put it on them, then you'll have uh, the priority over them. So it, it can be really good, and it'll make that your opponent, who's used to always fighting first, uh, won't see that coming. So oh yeah, definitely. And look, without a doubt, the Chaos Sorcerer has a Mask of Darkness. Yeah. Just so, you like say, he can keep up. Plus, it's good to have a late game teleport if he's still alive. Yeah. Uh, late what, game. What I've realised is whoever you put it on, the enemy's going to try and kill first. The enemy's going to try and kill Bellacore anyway. And like, and you know when you're saying like, Archeon cast two spells, and he's only really got Mystic Shield turn one, you know, so there's not much to cast. In my Archeon list, I have I can cast five spells a turn, but on my turn one, I can only really cast two. Or or maybe just one. Like, so it shows just to have that. It feels like it's a waste, so that's another reason why it's good to take the Palisade. Yeah, and the, and the Palisade, like I say, we're both included for like the same reason, helping and shooting. And plus, I've got a bit more of a model count in my army. But still, you do generally have a low model count in Host of the Ever Chosen, so it's good to kind of block off. Less models to paint. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're a bit more higher detailed. Some. Oh, it'll, it'll take you longer. <laughs> it will feel. It will feel better. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can paint twenty Marauders to one Baron Guard. <laughs> pretty sure I can paint twenty Marauders in one evening. <laughs> you don't question the quality. But the Palisade is good for. Blocking off mm. areas, uh, well, especially also, in front of the objectives, and that just to make it bloody annoying to get around them. And like you can, you can chuck it out there, and you know, like when we say, then then you eat it up when you want to charge where it was. Um, there's a good chance that enemy unit that was stuck behind it are also minus one to hit because it does that like boom effect, doesn't it? Where all units within six inches of it at the start of the turn roll dice to them on a five up, they. Uh, a minus one to hit if it's in the realm of meta I believe it is it's on a four up the minus one to hit so be careful that doesn't backfire on you as well yeah it, it takes some um, good positioning to not screw mm. yourself either yeah it's, it's definitely worth reading because I, I think oh, I can't remember it might be like the second ability in the war scroll and like to be honest until I started playing with it I was like yeah it makes it stops line of sight and it's like yeah but there's, there is this other ability it does it's like oh what's that Oh, okay, now both my units of Aaron Garden Arms want to hit. It's like, ah, I've learned now to uh, read the whole War Scroll and not just <laughs> stop reading after the bit you're interested in. Yeah, it's, it's something else, I'll get to it later. <laughs> but um, no, yeah, I, I like that, man. I think that, I think that's cool. And it's not, nice. Again, we're trying to, when we do these videos, again, we're not saying these are the strongest ones we already mentioned, but we also try and make them different from each other. Like, we don't both go Nurgle, we both go Corn or something, because we just want to show what flexibility there is out there 
If you're wondering, yeah. yeah. If you're wondering, like, why haven't we done many undivided? It's because simply they're the weakest mark. Um, sorry to tell you that, but it, it is true. The um, only good thing undivided kind of have is the, the undivided war shrine ability. But you don't need to be great. undivided for it. <laughs> but yeah, but you don't need to be undivided for it. It's pointless, right? <laughs> so it, it kind of like nullifies. The other thing is undivided in host the ever chosen. One of the big things about undivided is being like immune to battle shock. You're immune to battle shock anyway in this army until Archaon dies. But if Archaon's died and you're not in a strong position on the board, you've probably lost the game. So it doesn't really matter at that point. Um, but no, so that's fun. Anything else you want to say about the list, Jamie? No, I uh, no, we're trying to be different from each other. Obviously, like, Barrel Guard, you, you want more. But, like, for me to get another unit of Barrel Guard, I'd have to chop and change. Yeah. Like, the Marauder Horsemen oh. and the Knights. and. Honest, honestly, you have no... This is going to sound really weird, right? But there were, there were times where, like, I don't know, I was gymming, right? And there's, like, I delayed some times in between my next exercise. So I'm thinking, I'm on the Xero app on my phone. I'm like... I've, I'm literally just there, like, completely. I should be focusing on the workout, but I'm just like, do I just drop a unit of Varangard? But then if I do that, I'm missing out on my circle ability. And it's just like, why is that in my mind at that moment in time? <laughs> and just so much. So, uh, me and you, we spend so much time misbuilding. And it's just like, it's just like little things. And it's interesting to see that you've done that, but it's because then you've made that one unit have one role, which I like. So, uh. Yeah, they have, they have one purpose. And I said they wouldn't let me down. They won't let you down. Uh, no, exactly. Are they in scrolled weapons as well? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I went. So that just uh, more dice, rerolling all crowd hits, all wounds. Yeah. I'm thinking I put those extra one damage on the on, on the six to wound for the mark ability. Yeah, I, I, I think that's good. I, th I think it works. It's, it's pretty solid. Um, just make sure, obviously, they're in range of Archeons and still get the. They need to be in range of him or someone else to get the sixes to the damage. But uh, I'll count them aura. They, they should be. Um, the other thing I will say is, like, usually when you look at units and you go, like, oh, the inscribed, like, I don't know, the hand weapon, but the spear looks cooler. Trust me, these ins these ensorcelled weapons or even. Uh, like, I've made one of my, like, centaur vanguards, and his weapon is just literally a fucking solid bit of steel mallet. That's about the size of someone's torso. <laughs> like, it's absolutely... It's it's bigger than that, to be honest with you. It's absolutely mental. Um, it, it is one of the best kits out there. Yeah, it, it's, it's really cool. I've got two more, more to build, but um, maybe we'll get that done before lockdown if I've got the motivation to paint more knight-styled things for <laughs> my Sacred Darkness. Um, but anyway, so yeah, with that, that is the host of the Ever Chosen. And then the next ones we're going to look at are going to be a little bit different because they're not actually in the battle tome for Slaves Darkness. They're going to be from the Wrath the Ever Chosen book. Fantastic book, great storyline. Me and Jamie are actually in the middle, well, I say in the middle, at the start of doing the narrative campaign for that and then lockdown happens. So <laughs> we'll get to that at some point. Great, great fun though. So we're going to look at the um, Knights of the Empty Frame from that. And then we're going to have a look at, after that, we'll look at the Idolates as well from the Broken Realms Marathi book. So the first one, like we said, we're going to have a look at, it's going to be the Knights of the Empty Throne. So this list I've got, and it's something we said when we looked at the other lists here, is that it's not going to be the typical one you look at to build the most competitive Knights of the Empty Throne one, but it's one that I've seen and I think that when I have came up with this, I want to try it out. I haven't actually played it yet, but I think it would be quite fun. And um, when we talk about the Knights of the Empty Throne, I just want to cover a few things because we haven't actually covered them in our huge God knows how long in-depth army review. You know the one's about 20 hours, Jamie, probably about 20 hours and it's done. Uh, we didn't actually cover Knights of the Empty Throne because they're not actually in the normal Save Stars rulebook. So, uh, no, they're in, uh, they're in the Wrath of the Ever Chosen. Yeah, so it's something that can return to at some point. But we're just basically, for the sake of this, I'll tell you essentially what it is. So... In the Knights of the Empty Throne, it's the one you want to take, the sub allegiance, if you want to take Varangard but not Archaon. That is basically what this is. And the reason behind that is because what are the Knights of the Empty Throne? The Empty Throne goes to the Varan Spire in the eight points, Archaon, the Ever Chosen's capital. And the reason why he's got an empty throne there is because his throne, he refuses to sit on it 
until he has conquered the entirety of the mortal realms. So I think that's quite a cool little, a little bit of narrative there. Um, but you can definitely, yeah. you can definitely imagine, can't you? Like, uh, I don't know, Archeons are fighting all the wars and everything. And then you've got the uh, Varangard who literally just standing there. It's like honor guard custodies, almost like in the chamber, just like going, Derek. Yeah. What do you reckon the chances I could go and sit on that chair? Well, that what well, the throne. Yeah. Well, our Keon isn't around, is he? You know, getting a bit tired and standing here for the last 10,000 years or something stupid. Just go for a yeah, little Yeah, has got better things to do than sitting on his chair, hasn't he? Yeah, exactly. I reckon the Varang... I reckon, like, it, it's the empty throne, but the Varangard's sitting all the time um, when their boss isn't around, right? So what we've got is... Uh, so the interesting thing about this, because it's all about Varangard, of course. I won't read this word for word, but I'll just tell you basically what you get. So your uh, Knights of the Empty Throne um, Varangard become heroes. So that means they can take um, artifact and command traits from the list you get from the Knights of the Empty Throne, which we'll get to in a moment. I'll tell you the ones I've picked. And they don't get Lookout Sir. So that is something important to remember. But what you do get is a huge footprint now for your Chaos Aura abilities that we've mentioned in every single list. Like, for example, on this list, it's all about corn. So I'll be getting easy access to the plus one to wound and the reroll ones to hit. So your footprint there is pretty big, which is nice. And then you also get a really good command ability, which I will read out because it's, I think it's fantastic. It's called Unmatched Conquerors. You can use this command ability at the end of your charge phase. If you do so, pick one enemy unit that controls an objective and, was in, um, and is within 12 inches of a friendly Knights of the Empty Throne hero. Roll a number of dice equal to the number of models in that unit for each 3 plus until the end of the battle round. The number of models in that unit that are counted when determining the control of an objective is reduced by 1. The same unit cannot be affected by this command ability more than once per turn. We talk about how this game is all about objectives. Knights the Empty Throne sort of emphasizing on the Varangards. You're thinking, oh, maybe I won't have so many models in my list. This is really going to help you out. And it's, yeah, it's, it's going to help great. you a lot against all those big hordes that hold objectives up, isn't it? Oh, the, the bigger the horde, the, the better it is. Like, you could literally... Um, Let's say, let's just say a big unit of Grots, right? Big unit of Stabbers, you know, best example. You know, 60 models, right? You're looking for free ups, so that means 40 of them won't count towards holding the objective, yeah? You charge them, you kill 35 of them, and then the Grots inspire presence themselves, blah, blah, blah. They're not running away, but despite they're having like 35 on an objective, 40 of them don't count towards the objective. So none of yeah, them count. And then, your, and then your free Varangard even, models have the objective. I mean, the only armies it wouldn't be effective, or that effective against, is going to be Ogres and Gargans. Because of how much their rule mm. yeah. counts them. So say like a Mega Gargan, I know there are ways to make them count more than this, but just like as a basic one, like, you know, counts as 20 models. Uh, this would only, if you rolled that free, uh, would only count as 19. So, like, it would still be high. Ogres, because, like you said, they get that plus one. Standard Ogres. It would take away the plus one, basically, they get, for controlling objectives. Um, but if you're going against, let's say, Flesh of Your Courts, loads of Terror Guys, and they've got a Terror Guys holding an objective, and you get this off, um, then that one model they have controlling that objective no longer counts. So, like... It, yeah, so yeah, which it, it's a great bit, I say. It's a game of objectives. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I really like that. And then the other thing they get is going to be failure is not an option, so you can use this command ability when a friendly knight to the empty throne Varangard unit is destroyed. If you do so, roll a dice on a five. A new knight to the empty throne Varangard unit of three models is added to your army. Set up the new unit wholly within six inches of the battlefield edge and more than nine inches away from enemy units. You cannot use this command ability more than once per phase. So that's really good. So when one of your knights of the empty throne vanguard units, or one of your vanguard units in this army, dies, you've got a third of the chance of it coming back with three models. Yeah, I'd would say it's not a bit to rely on with a five plus, but it is something that you, you know if you get off, 
it's, it's going to help because obviously it's an expensive unit. Yeah, really, like 280 points for, for free models. Um, I would definitely say like we, there are other abilities out there like this. Um, what I would say is it's not one of those um, on a roll of a six and it's like, oh, just, pff, you're never going to do it. On a five, like you've got, you've got a fair enough chance um, of doing it. You've got just as much chance of doing this as the enemy counting towards a model on an objective from the other rule. But uh, so that, that's basically what you get from just generic Knights of the Empty uh, Throne. I just wanted to tell you guys that before we went through the list, just to give you guys some background. Um, so going through the list, what we have got, like I said, everything that can be corn is corn. And what isn't, we'll get to later. So what we have got is going to be a Knights of the Empty Throne Varangard times six. This is going to be our general because that's a massive block of Varangard. Um, what we've got for them as well is um, how I built this list is on War Scroll World, and for some reason it wouldn't let me put the weapon option, which I don't know why because Games Workshop, um, I don't know, don't want to spend their cash as much. But what we decided to give them was the Demon Forge Blades. So this is uh, three attacks each, one inch range, freeze to hit, freeze to wound, mass one rend, d3 damage. And then if you get a six to hit with this, it's a mortal wound in addition to all other damage. Now, in the last list we looked at, um, of the host of the Ever Chosen, when we looked at my one, I went for all and scrolled weapons on the charge, plus one damage, blah, blah, blah. It's a lot, right? But because we haven't got plus one damage here because we can't cover the sixth circle, obviously, because we're Knights of the Empty Throne, I decided to go for a different weapon. And I just wanted things to be a bit different than just talking about and scrolled weapons and sorcered weapons all the time. So that's why I went for those demon blades, and I think they're quite fun. I mean, who doesn't like the idea of a demon lashing out and stealing someone's soul, Jamie? I mean, oh yeah, I've always run demon blades. Yeah, in exactly. My corn army. It's great, and like, like we said, uh, freeze and freeze, but actually turns into for this unit anyway, or who was ever within this unit, because it's the Aura of Chaos ability within twelve inches of the general. You're going to be hit on freeze, you're running ones, winning on twos. So. Pretty, pretty good there. Um, so we got that, and then we've gone for the command trait is inescapable doom, which means enemy units within three inches of this general cannot retreat. So enemy units within three inches of you can't retreat, which is pretty useful. I mean, I can tell you as someone who has been playing a lot as Skaven lately, I am really starting to learn how useful retreat and charging is from their banners. They have all their little rats which um, is enough to win your games because you can just bugger off even if you've just got four clan rats alive in the unit against facing six Marin guards, you just bugger off of that, um, charge something else on an objective and then claim it. Like So it's really useful uh, retreating and charging or just retreating in general. And there's a particularly good uh, Doors of Cain army I happen to fight today on TTS that um, can retreat and charge, the whole army can. So this can try and stop things like that. So it is, re it is really useful. Um, and you've got a big footprint with this doing it. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I, I quite like that. I think it's quite underestimated. The, the annoyance of people retreating. I don't think you really notice it so much. I really think it's underplayed. Like it's because you, when you go against a very like good competitive players, um, you realize they just, it's a whole, Oh, well, we've always said this, haven't we? It's a movement game, right? And this is a movement people don't tend to do because I've been like it before. I'm like, I'm already in combat. I might as well fight my way out of it. So it actually shows how useful retreating is. And then when you when you come across something in the game that you can't retreat from, you're a little bit like stunned for a second. Like, oh, I'm not, not used to this um, because there's not too many examples out there. So, yeah, I do really like in, uh, Inescapable Doom. And then we have got, um, for our artifact, We I just want to say, there's another command trait that makes your 5-up spell ignore for your Varangard a 4-up spell ignore, and you have no idea how tempted I was to take that out, spite of how little I get 5-ups. So, <laughs> I like to try and make their saves better. <laughs> but um, I'm sure you can understand that, Jamie. Yeah, <laughs> looking at that, I, I thought, <laughs> it's not a bad one. But you just won't but... go against any... Like I know, like so, Lord Croak and there's a lot of other spellcasters out there who are very good Zeech as well. Um, but you know, if you take this, you're not going to fight against any of them. Yeah, and then if that's what <laughs> isn't it? Exactly. But you know, it, it is good. Um, but then going on to the 
artifacts, we have got um, the grasping plate, which is this unit. Um, so the unit bearing this artifact is eligible to fight in the combat phase if it is within six inches of the enemy unit instead of three, and it can move an extra three inches when it piles in. This is one of the best abilities in all of Age of Sigma, and I'm, obviously someone could pick out an example going, well, this is the best ability to be able to change any dice roll. I just mean as like a, a standard ability, and that's because like the Sisters of Slaughter have this from the um, Doors of Cain as well, which means that they can... Uh, not charge, they can run up the board as an example and then just be six inches away from the enemy. It means that when the enemy wants to fight them, they can't. The doors of came will be fighting you on their terms. Things like uh, Blades of Corn as well, they can do it with their demons or their bloodthirsters. I've done it with Archaeon, uh, making him being able to pile in six inches and be able to fight. And then there's also things like um, it just really is a good way to play in, like, like I said, just. Uh, what's the way, like, just fighting activations, really? Because you can hit the enemy before they can hit you. And like I said, you can run up the board with these guys. Um, you can make them run six. Yeah, it, it, kind, of, it kind of makes charging... Obviously, I think that's why I will say it's a good reason not to have the spears. Yeah, that's, I was just so going to say that one of the reasons when I was saying like, I want to make things different while I go Demon Blades, I just thought also by not going with the spears, I don't feel like I'm forced to charge all the time. That means I can make the most out of the grasping plate. Yeah, and, and it's also good for a Vanguard unit for six models. Because they're big bases, then piling them in yeah. six inches is going to help get them in. Because Vanguard, I'm very much, when I run them in Host the Everchosen that like we talked about already, um, I'm very much like units of three are the sweet spot, because even units of three, their bases are quite big. Um, so, unit of six, it's a big investment and a big um, base size. Which is good for the Aura of Chaos, like we mentioned, but can be a double-edged sword when it comes to trying to get a win because your Demon Forge Blades are only uh, one inch range weapons. So that is important there. Um, and it just means that you can charge or something else in your army into the enemy. And that, like, um, when we go through the list, I'll, I'll do a little summary when we go through this. I'll, we'll talk about the rest first and I'll do, say what I was going to mention. So the next one we've got is Knights of the Empty Throne, uh, Varangard. So again, this is a hero. Something just to mention as well was that. Um, the army must not include Archaon to make the uh, Varangard heroes and stuff, or the Archaon may just not be able to be in this army. I can't remember, but you know, you would not take him in this army. Um, so exactly, he's not playing the other yeah, the other chosen move out. Yeah, you want to take Archaon, host the other chosen. You want to take him to spoil his crack up. So the next one we've got after that is Slaves of Darkness, Demon Prince. So he's got the axe um, and he's Mark Corn. Reason why I've got him in is just the half enemy um, run and charge rolls. Just to really try and dominate the uh, the enemy's movement on the board, so it's it's a great command ability. It's going to cost you a command point, and with that, what you're going to do is um, 18 inches around him. We've already talked about this in this video. They're half and they're running charges, which is really good. Um, like uh, like I said, like I played against Doctor Kane today as an example, and I had an ability to make the enemy half a running charge, and it saves my skin in a combat phase as an example because the enemy couldn't make the charge um, and then we've got a chaos lord uh with reaper blade and demon bound steel that's there to make um, one of your units probably the uh, knight's empty throne uh six varangard unit be able to pile and attack twice so that that is pretty, pretty straightforward why is there um and then we've got the chaos sorcerer lord who is going to be Zeech, because can't be corn and that just means the real save are one so it's the best mark to pick for them if it doesn't fit your um mark for your whole army and she is she he whoever you've designed it my one's a she um is there for the uh spell to be able to make you reroll hit and wounds like we've already talked about and then the reroll save rolls um they've also got the mask of darkness spell for the teleport which is it's just good it's just great the reason why we've got it on um the chaos sorcerer lord is it means that when they let's say they want to put reroll save rolls onto those Vanguard. However, those Vanguard have just shot up the board. Now what you can try and do is teleport the Sorcerer Lord within wholly within 12 inches of them in your hero phase to be able to put the reroll saves on them. So teleport them up the board to catch up to do it. And obviously you can use it to teleport another unit of the enemy. Like we've got Marauders in the list, you can use it for that. And then we've got Bellacor. Who's got the spell Mask of Darkness? You may go, why? You just give them both the same spell. Yeah, it's the best spell in the whole book. So that's why they've got it, because I've realized if you only give it to the Chaos Lord and Sorcerer, uh, Chaos Sorcerer Lord, even, 
the enemy would just shoot the crap out of them and they die turn one, so or turn two maybe if you're lucky. Um, so if you put it on two, they can't kill both of them as quickly. You can and see it, and it is generally the best spell, isn't it? Yeah, I mean there are great other spells. I'm not saying oh it's the only good one. No, there are some seriously other good ones, but this is the best utility spell. Oh, and like I say, it, it's reassurance having it on two wizards, isn't it? Yeah, even if you wanted to, let's say, I'm not saying it's the best thing to do, but turn one or you're on a turn, there's not really much spells Bellacore can do. You can cast two, right? Let's say there's only like one he's going to cast, let's say. You could teleport him and then make him nine inches away from the enemy, which means he's within eight, 18 inches of them. So then he makes the minus one to win. Yeah. Like, you know, so there's, there's play as well using it on Bellacore. Um, to be able to do the Minus One to Wound, and then there's play on using it on the Chaos Social Lord to make them um, be able to keep up to the reroll save rolls. So we got that. Uh, and then for the rest of our units, we've got two units of 20 Marauders, uh, both got Axes and Shield for reasons we've already explained, best loadout, they're both Corn, and then we've got a Chaos Marauder Horseman unit uh, with Javelin and Shields, and then we've actually got an extra Command Point. I would always suggest taking an extra Command Point, saves Darkness Raid Command Point, Heavy army, depending on how you build it, and because we've got things like the Chaos Lord in there who wants to do making the Varangard attack twice and may need to burn a CP to catch up with them by making himself automatically do a six to run, um, you're going to get through it. You're going to spend a command point to try and bring back your Varangard, or at least three models, or also to try and make enemy models not count towards objectives. So you're going to be very command point um, hungry in this. Um, something just to say is that I've seen a lot of people take this and play touch. So you've got an extra command point there. Your Nurgle, which is generally really good, but I'm not here to talk about play touch such much. Um, we've already we've already covered that. And uh, so that is the list. The idea how I've kind of got this idea, um, sorry, this idea of this list in my head, is that you're kind of casting up. So you're protecting your Varian guard with your Chaos Marauders, because the enemy's going to struggle to get through all of them so quickly. And then what you want to do, if you can, get your Marauders to go up and just charge the enemy in their face. If they can, bog them down, that sort of thing. And then by the time the enemy has dealt with them, your Varangard are in range to then pile to a charge and attack the enemy. So you sort of like wave one of the Marauders going in, wave two is going to the Varangard. Or if you can't really do that because of circumstances of the game, Castle your Varian Guard and slowly move them up the board. You've got your Marauder Horseman in case you've got a back objective that they can just hold and then when things are looking good up the board or they're needed up the board, they can have got the movement to then get into the game. Um, you've got Bellacor, obviously, because he's also making uh, the most scariest thing in your opponent's army, not really being able to do anything for a turn or two. And then you've got a safe start on Steam Prince again, which is great because what I was going to mention before I went fully into the list was saying that the safe start on Steam Prince fights first at the combat phase, right? And then you attack with your, let's say, a unit of 20 Chaos Marauders. And then you uh, let the enemy uh, enemy attacks you. They're going to fight the Demon Prince or the Chaos Marauders that have already fought. And then after they've done that, um, you can then pile in with your unit of six Knights of the Empty Frame Varangard into that big scary unit that was forced to attack something that already had attacked it. If you do you understand that, Jamie? Yeah, I, I, I like that kind of uh, sneaky drawing kind of play, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, it's like it's been draw the enemy in and then kind of like pincer and kind of how they would describe it in the old war kind of things. Yeah, exactly. It's like a pincer move. It's like it's one of those things again. Like right, I've hit you, my Dean Prince. I hit you, my Marauders. Right, hit me back, but I'll be attacking you with my Baron Guard and you won't be able to touch them beforehand. Because definitely, like, like you're saying, try, with the six inch piling, what you, you were like saying as well was let them come drawn into you, attack whoever's in front of those Baron Guard, and then they can just pile in and murder wherever it is that's just trying to chop through the Marauders. I think this is a good army for. Not totally min max him, but you can definitely try and min max quite a few more bound guarding. Oh yeah, I'm like this, I completely say like I have not. I mean, by the time you've watched this, who knows? I probably have played Knights of the Empty Throne, but I, Knights of the Empty Throne is like one of the is the only one I haven't played for Slaves of Darkness. Like the only um, sub allegiance, 
And that's because when I've been playing Vanguard, I've just been smashing hosts of the Ever Chosen because I want to run okay on. Um, but this, so what I'm saying is that this is what I came up with, and I think will be um, quite fun. It's something I want to try. But there are definitely ways you can tweak this. Like this is open to flavour um, of what you can do. Like you could really go hard on the Vanguard in this list if you want to run as many Vanguard in your army as possible, and you're not really too bothered about Archaon because you don't want them in your army, or don't you want to paint them or something. Um, take Knights of the Empty Throne, one hundred percent. I think the the only thing like you're saying when you're kind of thinking is with the Knights of the Emperor's Throne, though, the Vanguard do count as heroes. So you can only have as many Vanguard as you can hero slots. Yeah. Yeah, so... But even if you were to go all Vanguard and take minimum size and you got six units of three, I mean, that's still a lot. That would be pretty awesome. That, yeah, I mean, like I can tell you in Hasty Ever Chosen, again, different sub what we talked about, so I won't dwell on it for long, but the most I ran was Archeon, some of his friends, and then three units of free Vanguard, and I can tell you, I didn't have a Chaos Sorcerer Lord, so I couldn't give Archeon rerolls the saves, which is the reason I only took that list once, but running three units of Vanguard, loads of fun, especially when I was charging units of Skinks, and they go, and I charge the Skinks, then they would shoot me, but then on a four up, they would move away, and they failed the four up, and I was like, huh, you can't run away from me, except your fate and die, bitch. Um, I, I think that's their complete comeuppance on what they deserve. Isn't yeah, it? It's like, just imagine, like, if it's like the Varangar, like the horses are like, I don't know, five times the size of a skink, and like the hooves just crushing them. <laughs> but um, no, it's, it's great, it's great fun. Um, so yeah, I, I really think that's all there is going to say. Like we already mentioned, um, I'm just going to do a list on this one and uh, the iLaters as well, uh, because I think uh, it, you, I only really want to do sort of like one or two lists covering this. Also, Jamie doesn't have access to all the rules as well, so I don't really, in practical terms, I don't want him to have to try and look it up on like screenshots and stuff and try and come up with different things. And we are reaching the end of a long, long video anyway. Um, so with that, we're then going to move on to my idolators. Now... Your, fav your favourite, absolute favourite. They have got a lot better, the idolators. That's what I will say. Um, we're kind of in one build. <laughs> and can you, if I was to say to you what's one good build that involves a battalion in Slayers of Darkness, can you tell me what it is? And it maybe starts with Plague. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it might be the Plague touch. Yeah, so, right, I'll get this out of the way. I haven't got Cultus in this uh, list. Why have I not got Cultus in it? Mainly, this is a list I came up with before the FAQ. So, Cultus were like, you want to take Cultus in this? I later, and then you don't want to because they can't be marked. So now, being marked, would I take idolator lists with cultists in? Yes, I would. Would you guys like me to do a video talking about different lists with idolators uh, using cultists? I could potentially do that. If you would like that, let me don't know down in the comments, and I will, uh, if there's enough interest in it, maybe I'll do it. But the reason why I'm talking about this list that has got no cultists. It's because this is a list I have actually run multiple times, like five times. So instead of me just coming up with a list I haven't actually played, I'd rather come up with a list that I have played um, so I can give you um, my experience, thoughts on it. If you're going to wonder, like, well, the Knights of the Empty Throne you haven't played, yeah, but well, I haven't played any of those lists. So <laughs> it's going to be either well, that list or no list. So going on the Iron Laters. Now, because I did a Corn list, sorry, because I did a Sinesh list, a Zeech list, I feel like the rest can just be corn because corn is really my favourite way to play Slaves of Darkness, or it has been, and it's what I've got the most experience in. So that's why this is going to be corn. Uh, although we haven't got cultists, we have got a chariot. So I haven't completely abandoned this. So... <laughs> I don't think we've. It's the first chariot in all the lists. And it's kind of because. Yeah. It's kind of because you've got to. Hey, look. This whole idolator thing. I went to a tournament, like this is complete, uh, after, guys, if you're watching this point, I believe you're just staying, <laughs> staying to listen to us rather than anything else, but I went to a tournament, and uh, I mean, I will, long story short, in f our three games, I didn't win any, but what I will tell you, is I had four chariots on my list, <laughs> and it was a you real big, you gotta love the chariots, oh man, I'll tell you what though, I charged a chariot into, just a normal chaos chariot, into, um, a unit of salamanders, right? Six more wounds. Uh, no, seven more to wounds in the charge. <laughs> yeah, the charge bit is not bad, is it? Seven more wounds of that charge. Poor. It was great. 
It was glorious. The, the, the salamander killed me, but you know, that's, that's neither here or there. Uh, and I called it, uh, what was it, like Too Fast, Too Furious, like Chariot Drift or something. But anyway, on to the idolators <laughs> while people are still listening. So, where we're going to be is from the mortal realm of Gur, because this is a narrative show and that's where we're from. Um, we are going to be the damn legion, idolators, as I've already mentioned. Then our leader is going to be the idolator lord on Gorby's chariot, because a big monster in front of the chariot is cooler than a horse. Will you back me up on this, Jamie? Yeah, it's a hundred percent cooler. And kind of the idolaters kind of make you do it. Yeah, like and and it works quite well. Um, because what else we've got on the list as well is we've got the, so we've got the command trait, which is fiery. Um, Oriator, which means that he can do two prayers because essentially idolators again we haven't really properly covered them on the channel i have uh, talked about this list in huge depth when i went on to the aos coaches channel so if you want to go onto his channel and check out uh idolator list rundown um factor focus i did two lists covering on, on that we went on for about two hours so if you want more in-depth reviews go check that out but what i will say is that the idolaters is basically what they're going to get is your cultists um, have a charge ability like Marauders. I haven't got any cultists in this list, so it's not as relevant. You can have a chariot as a idolator lord, which basically means you want to make him your general. He also becomes a priest, so he can do some prayers, not the war scroll, uh, sorry, not the uh, war shrine war scroll prayers, but he's got his own prayers access available to in the idolaters um, uh, part in the uh, can't get my words out probably. Uh, Marathi Broken Realm book. Uh, the basic some prayers, some are right, but he can only do the ones he's key marked for. So he can only do corn prayers, but he can do that corn prayer twice, which is the reroll hit rolls. So quite useful. Um, so that's what his command trait is going to allow him to do. His artifact is going to be uh, Predator's Talk, which is from the realm of Gurs, the realm of beasts. And the reason behind that is because. When Games Workshop were writing uh, the idolators, they basically uh, ripped down their command traits of a few uh, prayers, and then they were like, right, jobs are good in. Yeah, they, they called it down for the day, didn't they? It was, it was five to five no on Friday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then they got an FAQ, and they still didn't get artifacts. So like, when I reviewed this, um, I think maybe with the OS coach, I was kind of along the lines of, who knows, when the FAQ comes out, we may get artifacts. You know, I, I was, didn't want to hate too much. I was like, you know, come on, we'll wait for the FAQ. And the FAQ did make our ladies better, but it didn't give them artifacts. So I have to go to the realms to get artifacts. I can only be from one realm, and each realm only has one artifact. So that's why we've got the Protoss Talk. It's going to let me reroll charge rolls. I want to be charged in this army, and we'll get to that in a moment. We've got the Mark of Chaos, which is corn, and then we've got the Prayer, which is a Blessings of Corn. So again, that's the one to be able to make two of my units, I think it's wholly within 12 inches of me, uh, be able to reroll uh, hit rolls. The best thing about being the eye later as well is I'm plus one to my prayers. So where this would normally go off on a three up, it goes up on a two, which is almost guaranteed. And if I roll one, it's not like the gods are angry of you and you are struck down, you take D3 mortal wounds, which is, I imagine, kind of something like a slaughter priest has, Jamie, um, or a plague priest. So there's not really, you know, you just didn't get your thing, you're not going to take damage. We then have Bellacor to make the enemy not to be able to do anything. And then he's also got the spell Mask of Darkness, which we'll get to in a moment because that is going to be useful and very useful for this list. We've got a Chaos Lord on Carp Track, which correct me if I'm wrong, Jamie, we have covered why this guy is really cool. And it's mainly because of his look. Yep. And turns out, actually, you're very good in the game. So, and then in the units, we have got 40 Marauders. With axes and shields, mark of chaos corn, and then we've got three times uh, five units of chaos knights with cursed lances because those are the most fun, as long as you don't get stuck in combat. And then we've got the martyrs corn, and then we've got one slave of darkness chaos spawn, which basically just fit in the list. And then we have uh, two chaos uh, war shrines march corn. Why have we got two chaos war shrines? And that's because I wouldn't say every list requires a war shrine like it's not an auto include and have you looked at a lot of my lists i've given uh i can't really remember if any of them had a war shrine off the top of my head but why have we got two here because we're plus one to those prayer rolls so they're getting those reroll hit rolls and reroll wound rolls or any of the other prayers they want to cast they can only cast one but any of those other prayers means that they're going off on two ups rather than one which now means i can just rely on it guaranteed 
Like if I yeah. want to reroll, and, and if your if your army is giving you a buff, you you kind of you build your army to kind of benefit from that buff, don't you? So like Usually. like you say, if you're getting busted prayers, the more people you got in your army that can do prayers, right on. Yeah, and uh, and obviously they but then buff your other units that you need buffing. Exactly. And I might be going like, oh, well, you know, like the uh, I later Lord on, you know, the, the Gorby's Chariot and everything else go, oh, well, why make him cast two prayers? You've already got two other War Shrines in your list. Right, in this list, I have got, even if you just look at my three units of Chaos Knights, all of them, all of them want rerolls to hit, because they're hitting on fours. And then my Marauders obviously want reroll hit rolls and wound rolls. So, like, I'm never going to run out of things to put this on. In all doubt, even the Iron Later Lord and Gorby's Chariot, with obviously um, he's got the uh, the big glaive as well. Obviously, he would quite like the rerolls to hit as well. There's like there's no redundant like, and by putting in so many of these prayers, you mean if the enemy wants to get rid of your prayers, they're gonna have to try quite hard. Yeah, because the war shrines are pretty. Not we've been over. They're they're not proper easy to take down. No, they're, they're not. And the other thing is they're giving you that protection bubble, aren't they? Yeah, so you have a six up. Yeah, which obviously you know you go well. A lot of things in this army have got the five up, more wind saber, like the chaos knights, what have you. It's like yes, but honestly, everyone always goes on about mortal wounds, which there are a lot out there. But the amount of just normal wounds, if you can't negate them, is far far greater. So just having something, and then really we can't go further talking about this list and without mentioning the battalion we've got, which is the Runebringer Warband. We mentioned this, Jamie, when we talked about your list. It's all about the charging potential. Um, because that means my Chaos Knights, my Idolator Lord on Gorby's Chariot, and then my Chaos Lord on Karkdrak, which means I've actually taken a Slate of Darkness Battalion, one of the generic ones about being God Pacific, and managed to fit in two heroes in that, which I'm pretty pretty proud of. Uh, so that's not easy to do. This may be the only example, unless anyone else can point one out. And what that means is that even my, my, my Gorby's Chariot on the charge is doing uh, rolling two dice and every on, on a two up, it's a D3 mortal wound, so two D3 mortal wounds on the charge. My Chaos on the is doing two D3 mortal wounds on the charge. My Chaos Knights are doing D3 mortal wounds on the charge if they roll those two ups, which is um, pretty pretty tasty. And okay. then, it, it allows your drops as well. It allows my drops. And when I. E extra command point. Extra command point. You would say uh, extra artifact, but either yeah. lands don't so have any. That's the problem, and you run into because like, you rarely ever get in the problem where you go, I've got. I've got too many, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, you rarely get in a situation in Age of Sigma where you go like, I'm able to take two command, uh, I'm able to take two artifacts, but there's only one. Because usually it's hard to take a battalion because they're not all good. And then in this case I can. And then the problem you've got is I later don't have any artifacts. So you can only be from one realm. Like I said, you can only pick that artifact from that one. But there's no generic artifacts or Slate of Darkness. So you can't fall back there. Um, and you can't take from Ravengers or something because you're not Ravengers, as an example. Um, but what we have also got is the um, extra command point as well. So we've got, on your first hero phase, you've got three command points. If the enemy goes first and wants to hit you and try and make you like have to spend command points on battle shock and stuff, um, you've already got two. So you're, you're, you're laughing really at that point. The other thing I'd say though, so the tactics behind this list is kind of, this is a two-wave system. When I said in the first... Well, not sorry, not the first one, but what I talked about in the uh, Knights of the Empty Throne list, said like you could do it as Wave One Marauders, Wave Two uh, Varen Guard. This really is basically that's its game plan. You can like prep for an Alpha or something, and, well, if you're going to get striked by basically stretching out the Marauders. Um, anything else is screening, then you counter charge on the Knights and everything else. But the idea is that you're going to teleport your 40 Marauders nine inches away from the enemy. Now, there's no way to get any pluses to this unless there's arcane on the board or anything like that. Bellacore hasn't got any pluses. So what this means is you need to get a flat 7 to cast. Which, in my, I can tell you, in my fight, I think I had like four games of this list or something. It only failed once, which is obviously huge luck on my end. But, uh, only, only, but on the average, Jamie, only one in four chances of getting this not happening. Yeah, this has got this has got a seventy five percent success rate. This has. When, when you think casting seven doesn't sound too bad, you know that is the average. But when you got 
so many strong casters out there in the game. He definitely was running your luck with that. Yeah, I even went against Techless with this. Um, so the, like, against Croak, you're, you're kind of screwed. But what I would say is that the biggest thing is if you have to, I've had it. If I looked at the enemy's army, like let's say it was like when I went against Techless, I was like, he's not going to strike me. Turn one, you know, I'm going to outdrop him with this list that I had. He's not going to strike me turn one. Um, he's not really a combat offensive arm. He's not going to run and hit me. So I don't need to screw in my marauders. So what I'm going to do, I literally, I was playing a uh, thing as total commitment. So that's the one, I know you probably can't remember, Jamie, but that's the one where the board is split into like diagonals. So like you can be quite far away from each other. Yeah, I think I remember the one. So what I did is I had Bellacor right in my back corner, surrounded by marauders. Which, before I did the teleport thing, this is very important to remember, you want to put your prayers onto the Marauders because you don't want to teleport them and then go, oh, I've got to do the prayers, now I'm out of range. You don't want that to happen. So do the prayers, teleport them, because you're so back in that corner, unless you're going against Lord Craig, who's got like a board Y arm bind or anything like that, the enemy won't be in range to unbind you, so then you're just relying on getting the average on two dice. You get the average, you charge them in, and then you will... Um, obviously, you, you'll probably destroy their screen when you charge because those marauders buffed up will do insane amount of damage generally um you either just wipe up their screens and bog everything else down or you'll do more than that and if the enemies fail to screen properly you're gonna do so much damage to them that not every time but you're gonna make it quite hard for them to have to recover that could take a, a turn or two's work while you're doing that Everything else, so in that example anyway, against the um, uh, Luminef, I actually managed to teleport behind him and take out all his sh shooting units, all those sentinels. But what you want to do, in most cases, the enemy will scream behind them, so you can't do that. But if you can, take advantage of it. So you charge the front lines if you can't, um, and then you're running all of your knights up the board. So then when it gets to turn two, which either your Marauders will have survived, because you're also going to run up your, let's say, your Chaos Lord and Karkadrak, or your... I did later uh, Lord and Gorby's chariot to make sure that one of them are in range of those Chaos Marauders for Battle Shock. Because then what that means is those block of 40 Marauders were actually quite hard to kill, especially if you put real save rolls on them from the Zeech prayer on the War Shrine. Means they are going to be blocking down the um, enemy for about one to two turns, more than enough time for you to run your knights up and then charge the enemy on your turn two. No matter who really gets turn the priority for turn two, and then and, and that's like a big, uh, the big ability from the Marauders is that when you do teleport them, they're like ninety nine point nine percent trying to get their charge off. Yeah, they they only fail it on a double one. I think it's a double. One. Basically, let me just try and think. Out. Basically, how it works is you change your low. You roll. You roll your charge you change your lowest dice roll to a six. So the minimum you can charge is going to be a seven because you roll a double one, you change that one to a six. You... And then they have, do they have the horn blower? They have a horn blower or a drummer or something to give them plus one. So your minimum charging is eight. You're nine inches away when you do the teleport to be able to set up, which means on a double one, you will fail. However, if you get more than a double one, you're going to be successful. And you can even, there are ways to be able to have things in range in this list if you want to spend a point to reroll their charge if needed. Like, you're going to get that charge in. The hardest thing is getting that spell off. If you're going like, let's say you're going against Lord Croak and you go, he can unbind me for anyone on the board and he's something like plus three to unbind, right? I'm just not going to get this spell off. Um, what you want to do is use your reward as a screen from Salamanders and stuff anyway, what Lord Croak's going to chuck at you. And then you're still going to do the same plan. But is you're just going to have to delay it a turn because instead of teleporting, you're just going to have to move your marauders up. Just if there's nothing in range of the enemy, just run them up the board. So then they're moving. They don't get any buffs to run apart from plus one from the drummer or whatever it is. So they're running average, what, three plus one from the drummer. Movement, I believe, is six off the top of my head. So they're moving ten, which just means on your next turn, you'll be able to make the charge. So you're just delaying things by a couple of turns. So it's not like... This is well. This kind of is a one-trick pony. This list, but if you go, I'm not, definitely, I know I'm not going to get the teleport off. There, there is a way for the uh, pony to try and do another trick. It's like the prancing pony at this point. 
And, uh, and then he's still got strong units in the army, and like marauders can easily do a job. Yeah, knights right, rolling well. Well, the other I'm, re- I'm definitely on the charge. You, know, like you always want knights with lances on the charge. Yeah, like we said, the problem with knights with lances is that if they don't kill what they're fighting on the charge and they get bogged down in combat with it, they literally get to a point where their horses are pretty much as strong as their lances in how good the lance is to fight, right? So, this extra D3 mortal wounds on the charge, it just helps you to clear the enemy unit, so then when it's your turn next, you can then charge something else. And then do another D3 mortal wounds. Yeah, which is definitely an added bonus, isn't it? And it helps get through certain uh, high saves as well. Extra more wounds is always good. Yeah, uh, like beyond anything yeah it's it's really because also you don't have loads more wound output on this list so like if you go against Ishtan Guard as an example um, like you're probably still going to struggle but what this means instead of you just going I'm minus two rend on the charge and they just go yeah I don't care mate just tell me like how much damage is oh you don't need to tell me because I've I've saved it anyway Um, like this is going to at least help you a little bit against it which I'd say. So, uh, with that, is there anything else you'd like to sort of say about the list, Jamie? Because other than that, I'll sort of wrap things up. Look, well, like I say, in the FAQ, they did change it to cultists can have the keywords, doesn't it? Yeah, so cultists can have the keywords. So, it's really, honestly, guys, like like I said, this is a list that I've run multiple times, and I've, I've had good fun with it, and I've actually been pretty successful with it as well. Um, but there are ways to make it better. If you want to make the best uh, I latest list, uh, go cultists go like probably play touch the reason why I, as if you're not really aware and I just go play touch really good don't want to talk it's just because I see a lot of people doing it and I find it a bit boring everyone's doing it and the reason why it's good is because um, and to be fair I fought against someone in my discord who did it and it was really quite like an interest in fighting against something like that it's because um, basically what it means is so if you fight against it and the enemy so let's say you fight against it let me put you in that perspective every six you get to wound against the enemy unit in melee you take a mortal wound. Which you can now see how much damage you can do back to you. Like my host of the Ever Chosen army, if I use that against a play touch army, I would probably kill myself with the amount of attacks I'm making. The other thing I would say is um, uh, like why that is useful is because Iron Golems are also, the other thing to mention as well, because uh, Cold has become battle line in nine layers. So that means that Iron Golems are now your much better Chaos Warriors and they're re-rolling saves like they are. So you can see... a lot cheaper, aren't they? You can take a huge block of Iron Golem, like absolutely ridiculous um, block of Iron Golems in your army, and you can make a huge amount of it. Like, for example, you can take 32 in a unit. We've just looked it up. For 280 points. And that's more than 32 but, wounds. Yeah, you remember the ogre? someone's got 32. Fair enough to them. <laughs> well, I, well, yeah, I know you say that, but you only need to buy two of those boxes. Because they come in units of 20 now, don't they? Like you buy them. Yeah, you, yeah, you got the big box. So like, and the thing is though, is that's not just like 32 wins, is it? Because you get uh, the ogre breach yeah, that counts for, in something for every three wins. for every eight. So you get an extra what's that? 32, and then plus uh, say two more extra because you would count that as one. So you're it's I don't know. Quick mouse and tired. It's something about 40 wins or something. Like it 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 is good. It is good, and um, I would like to play around with it and do things like I would like to take our maid because I think our maid are great because the enemy can't retreat for them. Another great example what we mentioned earlier. Um, so I think I think there's a lot. There's there's more than just that. There's there's a lot of examples. Splinterfang are good. Chorus Cabal might be good. Um, and like I said, if you want me to dive more into our letters again, because like rather than just saying like it just felt like a failed project at least they'll be made better now um if you want me to say that and do a video on it like i said let me know down in the comments and if there's enough interest i'll do it um there's always on my content you guys want to see but apart from and there's also other things like i think you get like you get to reroll ones against uh enemy priests or plus one to what uh, wound against enemy priests something like that but i, I hardly remember because it never came up but like nagash is a priest so like it can be useful um but with that, that's pretty much it, I think. Is there anything yeah, you want it's to good to have another way. And I like it how they um, use the chariot. If, you know, I always think the chariots are really cool, and it's quite cool that you can make one into a hero. Mm. It kind of reminds you of the, the, what's it, the hero maker that they released as well. 
Uh, that you can make your own hero. Uh, yeah. Anvil of Apotheosis. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Away, General's yeah. Handbook 2020, in case people aren't aware, you can make your own heroes and give them points. Are they legal for tournaments and stuff? Probably not, but you can play amongst your friends. But you can, but instead of it just being like, oh, guess how many points, like there's actually a point system for it, which is cool. Um, which works out. But um, yeah. So with that, I'm going to thank you very much, Jamie, for joining me in this very long video. We've actually had to do this video in several installments um, because it was just going to be too long to record in one go. And there was also the FAQ what was coming out and it may have changed things, but then it didn't. So we could have actually recorded this a while ago. But here we are. And I'll it's tell you a, what. It's been a great Slaves of Darkness journey. It's been a great Slaves of Darkness journey because we have actually... Poor... Like I said, about twenty hours. You <laughs> went to this properly. Well, you didn't join me. You didn't join me for the law one. You skipped that because I didn't. Because I didn't ask you to come. <laughs> uh, well, it, it's been great being able to, in you know, from now we you know we're still in lockdown. I haven't gamed in person for coming close to a year now. Yeah. It has been nice just to keep your mind in the Warhammer. It yeah. makes me makes me motivated to do my get my slaves to start like, rocking again. Definitely, and like, I, but I don't want to lie to you. Even like people are watching and stuff, like, I don't like I know everything about slaves to darkness. I know so much more about slaves to darkness now by doing this massive series. <laughs> like, and and it's I just generally think it's a really interesting book, and that's why I really enjoyed doing this series. So I'm not gonna lie to you. When I cover armies, I, I I don't play. Like I don't know, for example, Nurgle. I didn't enjoy doing that one as much because it's not an army I play. But this is an army I do play, and I've spent a lot of time working on it, and I can't wait to actually get it on the table. So this is a lovely way going over lists of what we can actually play when we get it on the table. And I've actually got a room bringers battalion that built and painted, so that's why I'm sort of emphasising and why I really like it. Unfortunately. In, in this video where I've covered loads of uh, like core marked armies uh, for Slaves Darkness, my army is all um, converted and painted as Sinesh. But you know, the means is a way. But with that, what I will say also as well, a massive thank you to every single one of you guys. If for some reason you've just clicked on this video and it's towards the end, I am going to be doing timestamps after this premiere is over. So that means that you can go and just check out certain lists if you only want to know about uh, Kabulis or you want to know about uh, the spoilers. You'd be able to do that rather than sitting long. I, I mean, I don't know how long this has gone on for. I'm going to guess like so at least three hours, maybe. Um, probably looking at it, probably more. But who knows? Who knows? So you can go and click on these timestamps. So you don't have to watch the whole thing if you don't want to, or you're just a bit rushed on time. Um, but what I would like to say is if you have enjoyed this video, please absolutely smash the shit out of that like button. As when me and Jamie put this much time into these videos, we really do appreciate it when uh we see people have enjoyed it really because like otherwise if we don't really see people enjoying it then we're like fucking hell that's a lot of time spent wasted doing that <laughs> so um okay on demands it okay on does demand it exactly 100 percent. like that is why his throne is empty as soon as you like this video he's a step closer to sitting on that throne and having a nice retirement so no, um, victory one <laughs> exactly so smash that like button smash the subscribe button if you haven't already Guys, if you really like Slaves of Darkness and you're new to the channel and you haven't seen my other Slaves of Darkness, like we said, we've got about 20 hours of that content on here. And that's all the updated stuff. I mean, we've got more older stuff as well if you want to watch that for some reason. And then also press that bell notification button if you haven't already. That's the little bell button. Uh, button. And what that means is um, it certainly helps out the channel of algorithm and stuff. And it are free clicks by doing like, subscribe and bell notification that absolutely help out the channel um, and are absolutely free to do so. And it just shows a huge uh, support to the channel which i really do appreciate what i'd also like to say though is a massive shout out to my patrons as always who because of them i'm i'm, I'm uh, able to do this as it takes a lot of time obviously like i said and especially in, like videos like this to cover it all and by getting support i get from my uh, patrons and also youtube members now is a huge not just reason but the reason like not just the only reason, but really just a huge drive for me keeping this up and uh, really can't thank these people enough. So that's going to be my Morgars, who are my biggest supporters. So that is going to be Sandback, Jonathan H, Philco, Bleed Red and Christopher G. Guys, you people are giving me so much support. I really do not know what to say. And apart from just please give it up and please don't realise that this is still a direct 
Damn it, and you realize, oh shit, I need to cancel that. <laughs> Please keep it up, I really do appreciate it. And then also my vampires doing a great job as well, which is Mir, Martin S, Raspberry21, David A, and Ronnie H. Guys, thank you so much for your support. My Necromancers was Jack L, Radiation Riley, AW77, Dice Sagas, Wolf Nick, Michael W, Quad, Cranky Wombat, Christopher F, Christopher C, and James S as well. You guys really do help support me as well. And I do want to mention that we have actually got our first YouTube member. And if you're wondering what that is, it's a little join button next to the subscribe button, which means that you can start supporting me here on YouTube without setting up a Patreon account, I think. And that is something which uh, Doug has done. So Doug Popson has become a member to me. So essentially, he is now supporting uh, Asian Agash officially. And I really want to say a massive thank you to you, mate, as well. Thank you for deciding to support the channel. It really does, like I said, not just help keep me going, but it's the reason I go. If, like, I'm... Um, not getting support by this, like fuck been all this time to YouTube. So uh, thank you so much for doing that. I really do appreciate that. And what I'd like to say, if anyone would like to become a Patreon, you'll find a link to my Patreon top of the description down below. Go to my Patreon, even just consider giving anything, even just a dollar a month. It really goes straight towards me keeping up, making these videos, helping people get into Age of Sigma and then helping people with their Age of Sigma journey. And um, what I'd like to say is that also if you think the Patreon's a bit tricky and stuff, like I said, Press that join button, next to the subscribe button, and that just means you can become a member to Agent Agash and support me straight on YouTube, and it's probably a bit of an easier thing to do so. I would say that Jamie gets a cut of the money, but I oh, don't make enough money to pay you anything, Jamie. So thank you very much for your free time. I know I haven't told you that until the end of this series, but I thought now is a good time to let you know. Well, no, no, I own the Chinese. I've, I've, Chinese is more than my yearly earnings. <laughs> 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 maybe one day, maybe, maybe we can get you a Chinese knockoff of the Chinese, and we will be able to do that. But anyway, I've been around for a long time, guys. You can hear me. I'm getting tired, so I'm going to thank you all very much for watching this. Please keep painting your slaves of darkness. If you're working on them, let me know. If you've got them painted, that's great. And if you want any advice on slaves of darkness, don't feel like oh, I've covered them now. That's it. Ask me a question down below, and I'll try and help you out best I can. But with that, guys. I'm going to thank you all for watching this. Again, thank you to Jamie for joining us. And until next time, remember to stay safe, wash your hands, stay hygienic. For God's sake, wear a mask. So that means that when lockdown is over, if over, that kind of what it ties into, we can actually start playing again and playing with our Slaves of Darkness, of course, more than anything else. But what's more important than that is remember until next time that Nagash is all and all is one in Nagash. <laughs>